climate change is accelerating. Scientists fear that the damage caused by emissions is producing even more extreme weather events than predicted. We need to adapt to this new reality and fast. This is particularly true in Africa, a continent that has contributed little to global warming but is bearing the brunt of its consequences. Africa is one of the most vulnerable continents to climate change and climate vulnerability, a situation that unfortunately has been aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Africa contributed just 3% of global emissions, but we are the continent which will pay. Nos échanges devraient se focaliser sur les actions d'adaptation aux impacts de changement climatique. Climate change presents a collective action challenge. Uh, we all have to act across every sector and every country. GCA's State and Trends in Adaptation Report on Africa presents the most comprehensive overview of climate risks on the continent. It is a detailed blueprint for action, facilitating transformative programs by offering innovative adaptation and resilience, ideas, solutions and policy recommendations. The Global Center for Adaptation and the African Development Bank launched the African Adaptation Acceleration Program. The program which is endorsed by the African Union and advances the objectives of the African Union's African Adaptation Initiative will mobilize $25 billion for Africa for climate adaptation. We need to gather all together and get those solutions in place. So let's be bold. Let us be optimistic, let us be collaborative, and I count on you all. We do have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to build forward better and build a more resilient, prosperous future by integrating climate adaptation at the heart of the recovery. Climate change adaptation is an opportunity to realize a resilient future for Africa, making Africa safer, greener and more prosperous. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are joining us here in person and online, students, colleagues and members of faculty here at the University of Nairobi, hello, greetings, good afternoon, good morning from wherever you are joining us around the world and welcome to GCA's Africa Adaptation Acceleration Day. My name is Yvonne Okwara and I'm very honored to be here with you all today and we are gathered here in person in Nairobi, Kenya and all around the world. We've got audiences who are joining us from all corners of the globe. Now, as you know, Africa remains the world's most vulnerable region to the effects of climate change. And that is why the Global Center on Adaptation, that is GCA, is prioritizing the mobilization of accelerating adaptation across the African continent. And that is why we're here today, because in just a few days, in less than a week from now, the world's attention will be drawn to Glasgow, where the world will be congregating for COP26. And that is why today we begin the process of building the momentum towards accelerating adaptation action, not just for Africa, but indeed across the world. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this day. And this is what we're going to have lined up for you here today. We're going to have the inaugural GCA CEO's annual lecture, and it'll be having a special focus on Africa. And then we will also witness here today the launch of the State and Trends in Adaptation in Africa 2021. Members of the press, you will get your moment to be able to speak to our leaders and just get to hear from them on their vision towards this. And then we will also have the GCA Africa Partnership Forum 2021, and the theme this year is Delivering Adaptation Action Together. And we are so pleased and so honored to be hosted here at what can only be known across the continent 
as the very historic Taifa Hall at the University of Nairobi. And we'd like to say thank you very much to our hosts. And it is at this moment that I would really like to be able to present to you and introduce to you our hosts at this magnificent event, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Nairobi, Professor Stephen Kiama. Professor, welcome. Thank you. Your Excellency, Honorable Hulu Kenyatta, President of the Republic of Kenya and the Commander-in-Chief of the Kenya Defense Forces, Honorable Kolyako Tobiko, Cabinet Secretary, Ministry of Environment and Forestry, Kenya, Professor Patrick Fakojin, CEO Global Center on Adaptation, Your Excellency, Amina J. Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. Your Excellency Ban Ki moon, the eighth Secretary General of the United Nations. Your Excellency Dr. Kiwumi Adesina, President of Africa Development Bank. Your Excellency Georgiva, Managing Director, International Monetary Fund. Your Excellency Kojo Iweara, Director General of the World Trade Organization. Your Excellency Patricia Espinosa, Executive Secretary, UNFCC. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm highly honored to welcome all the guests present here at the Taiva Hall, University of Nairobi. And those joining us online across the globe, to participate in this forum, the GCA Africa Adaptation Acceleration Day. This forum is being held ahead of the forthcoming 26th UN Climate Change Conference of the parties, COP26, in Glasgow, Scotland, next week. The key targets of COP26 include securing global net zero by mid-century and keeping 1.5 degrees within reach, acceleration of adaptation to protect communities and natural habitats, mobilization of green finances to support adaptation, forging partnerships and collaborations to accelerate climate actions. The GCA Africa Adaptation Acceleration Day also coincides with the University of Nairobi Annual Research Week 2021, therefore giving us an opportunity to bring more people together to reflect on the adaptation actions in Africa, what we have done and what we need to do. Climate change is real threat to humanity. And if we did not do anything to address it, the future remains very uncertain. We must all arise to secure our future and the future of our planet and all that it contains. What what then needs to be done? The least developed economies who all combined contribute below 5% of the carbon emissions need justice from their counterparts from the industrialist nations. A kind of a Marshall Plan, similar to the famous US program that provided aid to Western Europe following the devastation of the World War II. It was the brainchild of George Marshall the 50th U.S. Secretary of State. Developed countries must live to their commitment and prioritize adaptation as an important strategy. As a premier academic institution in this region, the University of Nairobi will continue to play its right role in climate change and adaptation actions through research and training required to provide innovative solutions to the challenges that we face now, tomorrow, and in the long-term future. Education for sustainable development is our responsibility. The University of Nairobi is ready to partner with others to build a human, the human capacities required to address this problem. To this end, we have established three prime, premier research institutes 
the Institute for Climate Change and Adaptation, Wangari Madai Institute for Peace and Environmental Studies, and the Center for Environmental Law and Policy that aim to train and generate scientific evidence related to the challenges facing Kenya, East Africa, Africa, and the entire world at large. On climate change, adaptation, and environmental stewardship of our planet Earth. Renowned scientists from this university will continue to work with other partners on technology transfer and capacity building on adaptation. The university will continue to prioritize research and work with partners in this area to provide robust suits of evidence that feed into key policy decisions. The university has a youth population of about 6,000 who are drawn from all over the Republic and globally. They can be transformed into green champions for the future. We commit as a university to retool the young people to be the drivers of the transformative economic shift to green economy. We will empower our youths to activate green clubs and use them as vehicles for change. Youth in Africa constitutes the majority of voters. They can use their new, new, numerical strength to elect leaders and influence governments to prioritize adaptation programs. This afternoon, we have a congregation of key influencers, His Excellency the President of Kenyatta, and high-level representation from the government, the chief executive officers of the Global Center on Adaptation, representation of the highest offices of key international organizations, such as the United Nations, the African Development Bank, the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, to name but a few, along with other private sector business donor agencies, diverse, diverse in first organizations, and of course, academia, and students. We cannot, therefore, fail to identify and lump up support for the continent's key adaptation priorities going forward and to come up with a mechanism to fully engage the public, communities, business, and the other stakeholders in the design and implementation of identified actions. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to conclude my remarks by appreciating the bifocal leadership role that the government of Kenya has continued to play towards climate adaptation. Adaptation is a complex process that requires concerted efforts of all partners. Adaptation is our health. It is our hope. It is our future. I welcome you all this afternoon to the GCA Africa Adaptation Acceleration Day at Taiva Hall, University of Nairobi, Kenya. Let's take action. Time is running out on us. There's no other option. Adaptation, adaptation we must. And with those few remarks, I want now to welcome His Excellency President Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta to address the gathering. Thank you very much, um, Professor Kiyama, and for your great hospitality here. Indeed, um, from what you have said, it is no accident that we have been hosted here. Thank you for your hospitality and for the work that you continue to play and the role you play in uh, mitigating and, most importantly, uh, looking towards adaptation, towards the effects of climate change. Now, as Professor Stephen Kiyama said, it is now my honor to invite President of the Republic of Kenya, President Uhuru Kenyatta, to inaugurate our event and start of our proceedings. Your Excellency, Mr. President. Professor Dr. Patrick Verkorjian, Chief Executive Officer, Global Center for Adaptation. Dr. Akuimi Adesina, President of the African Development Bank Group. And Dr. Ngozi Okoji Iwela, Director General of the World Trade Organization, Ms. Patricia Esponsoza, Executive Director of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to join you at this important event on adaptation to climate change. This is an issue of great importance, not only to me and my administration, but also to all our Kenyan people and the entire 
African continent. I note that this inaugural lecture on adaptation on Africa, and I'm pleased that the first edition is taking place here in Kenya. Ladies and gentlemen, the recently released sixth assessment report of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has confirmed that the African continent is the region most exposed to and adversely impacted by climate change. We are together seeing major climate change impacts across our African continent. These include the ongoing drought that has ravaged eastern parts of our country and precipitated famine, as well as the 2020 floods that we saw here in East Africa, which affected over one million people. Additionally, and this is notable, is that the worst locust, locust outbreak in 25 years, which left about one million people food insecure in the Horn of Africa, and the March 2019 cyclone Ida, which affected more than 1.5 million people in Mozambique. Further evidence does indicate that climate change will have a devastating sub-economic impact across the world, but quite severely here in Africa. If we do not take any action, Africa could, as a consequence, see its gross domestic product contract by up to 30% by 2050 due to climate change. While impacts will vary across the region, we anticipate that climate impacts will lead to overall yield reductions of at least 20% by 2050. Increased flooding will raise the risk of malaria, while frequent droughts will put severe stress on our water resources. So ladies and gentlemen, for Africa, a low emitting continent, the main priority is adaptation, and it is now an urgent imperative. We need to accelerate action to moderate the negative impacts of climate change, facilitate adjustment to expected climate impacts, and strengthen our capacity to absorb, accommodate, and recover from climate change effects. While it is relatively more difficult to design, implement adaptation projects, and while fewer resources are currently available for adaptation, we should not lose sight of the fact that adaptation is without doubt smart economics. Indications are that for an investment of 800 million US dollars in developing countries in climate adaptation programs, this would see and result in benefits of up to 16 billion US dollars per year. So ladies and gentlemen, let me say that Kenya has deployed significant financial resources to scale up its adaptation efforts. We have mainstreamed adaptation into our national development strategy and aligned it to future expected impacts of climate change. Kenya's updated national determined contributions provide a comprehensive overview of adaptation priorities that require international financial support. To implement our nationally determined contributions, we plan to invest approximately 8 billion US dollars over the next 10 years. This is just 10% of the total investment needed of the NDCs, and we therefore need support from our international partners. The financing challenge is not peculiar to Kenya. 
globally, funding for climate adaptation, which in 2017 averaged around 30 billion US dollars a year, would need to increase tenfold to meet the growing needs of vulnerable communities in our warming planet. The COVID-19 pandemic, ladies and gentlemen, has exasperated the funding situation. Countries around the world have collectively allocated over 20 trillion US dollars in COVID stimulus packages, thereby reducing greatly the resources available to combat climate change. However, climate cannot wait while we address COVID-19. We must address these two challenges together. Indeed, to make recovery truly sustainable, we need to institute green recovery measures that integrate adaptation and mitigation measures. So today I applaud the Global Center on Adaptation for its publication of a comprehensive report on adaptation in Africa. The State and Trend of Adaptation in Africa 2021 report, which is being launched today. This report has identified adaptation actions and investment opportunities that exist in Africa. These opportunities include climate resilient projects such as mangrove restoration, water storage, drainage rehabilitation, digital agriculture, as well as new innovative financing such as blending, blended financing to de-risk private investment and climate related debt swaps. So ladies and gentlemen, I applaud the leadership of the Global Center on Adaptation and the African Development Bank for developing the African Adaptation Acceleration Program. This program in principle aims to scale up and accelerate adaptation here in Africa by providing financial and technical support to African adaptation efforts. This initiative greatly paves the way for the continent to manage its climate-related challenges. It is important to appreciate that effective climate adaptation will require a paradigm shift that harnesses the full potential of science and innovation. For example, we need to leverage entrepreneurs willing to test and apply new technologies at scale, broaden the range of drought or heat resistant crops and provide real time weather information. To make this paradigm shift, we will lean on our institutions of higher learning. The University of Nairobi here in Kenya is one of a few African universities that offer graduate programs in climate adaptation. It demonstrates the importance that the government of Kenya attaches to the issue of adaptation. And I am hopeful that this session today will also open new opportunities to the University of Nairobi and the other forward le learning institutions in our country. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, and indeed as you are in no doubt aware, the upcoming COP26 in Glasgow has dedicated sessions on adaptation and financing. We are in this context keen to harness this platform to identify good adaptation practices and to catalyze public as well as private sector funding for adaptation programs in Africa, which can be presented during the upcoming COP26 summit. I thank you all and wish you very fruitful deliberations.
Thank you very much, Your Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta. Can we give him another round of applause? Um, and to continue to thank him for his visionary leadership, particularly on matters uh, regarding tackling climate change, uh, not just for Kenya, but for Africa and the continent. And it's very optimistic to hear about the funds that are being put in place towards this. And we cannot wait to see what happens. And like he said, COVID, the world will not wait for COVID. And so that is why we're here today to start to galvanize and mobilize the action as we head towards Glasgow COP26 in the next few days. Your Excellency, thank you very much uh, for those powerful and inspiring remarks. Now for um, a moment to just understand those critical issues for Kenya, Africa, and indeed the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. Let's give a round of applause for now what is our GCA CEO in that inaugural annual lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Dr. Patrick Verkoyen, who is the GCA Chief Executive Officer. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give him a round of applause as he makes his way here. Professor? Thank you so much. Honorable uh, President uh, Kenyatta, first of all, congratulations with your birthday. Secretary General Ban Ki moon, Chairman of the Global Center on Adaptation, thank you for your um, remarkable leadership. The Vice Chancellor, Honorable Minister, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, but particularly students, welcome. We are living inside the eye of the storm. My name is Patrick Fukoyan. I am indeed the CEO of the Global Center on Adaptation. The climate emergency has Africa at the crossroads. Business as usual is a sure fire route to chaos, but adapt to it and Africa will thrive. That is why I've come to Nairobi today to deliver this first inaugural annual lecture of the GCA. I was last in Kenya 10 years ago, and it is good to be back. Uh, I was supporting a, a climate smart agriculture project in Kusumu with 60,000 smallholder farmers. And I met a farmer there, Ann Akinji. She was involved in the program, like many others, which combined traditional agriculture processes with a new focus on tree planting, intercropping, mulching, and the new part, sequestering carbon. These approaches were clearly yielding a triple dividend. Agriculture productivity, doubled, the resilience of farmers became much higher, and agriculture became part of the climate solution. Anne was joined by 60,000 other smallholder farmers, but what the program really lacked, what it lacked was scale. Imagine this program across the whole of Africa. That would be real adaptation in action. Quite frankly, we don't need to learn how to adapt. We are already doing it, but what we need to do, what we have as a problem is the problem of speed and the problem of scale. Adaptation is far too piecemeal and way, way too slow. We need more ambition, which is entirely possible. At Paris, a few years ago, we had emission commitments on the table that had us headed for more than three degrees of climate chaos, climate chaos. Six years on, the combined pledges of the world's economies have us closer to two degrees, but we have to keep strengthening them to hold the line to 1.5 degrees. We need the same level of ambition for adaptation. But don't forget, 
we have even less time. The IPCC just confirmed we now will enter, we will enter the 1.5 degrees world in 2030. Certain impacts like extreme heat spells will double by then, and the urgency to respond will be nowhere greater than here in Africa. For accelerated adaptation to be a reality here, we need the financing, financing to work. But I'm here to tell you that we can do that too. The Africa Adaptation Accelera Acceleration Program, don't forget this, Africa Acceleration Adaptation Program, triple AP, is already a $25 billion initiative. We need to deliver it and build it up and set in motion bold financing in parallel. But 25 billion US dollars over five years is still a drop in the ocean. Compared to the challenges we face, this is the floor, not the ceiling for adaptation finance. It's the floor, not the ceiling. Most disasters in Africa are flood related. We know that. But drought has by far the greatest impact, affecting five times the number of people. Last year, more than one in five people here in Africa faced hunger. Given how we know this climate crisis is evolving, that is a very alarming stat. But again, this is not the full story. For us at the Global Center on Adaptation, the GCA, the real story of climate change in Africa is a story of resilience, of solidarity, of opportunities for a safer, greener, more prosperous continent. It is this story. The solutions and the innovation, the hard facts of science, and the leadership of communities, the need for coordinated action, and the urgent call for more and smarter financing. This is the story we capture. In the State and Trends Report 2021, the report we are launching today. And this is the report we are launching, and I hope that all of you will have a chance to read this. A report which was prepared with leading institutions and researchers from Africa and the world, including this university. A report that reviews the many sectors and economic activities impacted by climate change. But equally, a report that focuses on solutions and action. And as we were preparing the report, we interviewed youth, small entrepreneurs around Africa on climate change. And we were all impressed by their stories of resilience. The story, take one, Lucia Gulugulu, a young community nurse, where? Zimbabwe, is particularly compelling. I learned from her how she was caught, caught off guard by what at first looked like another rain, but it turned out to be Cyclone Ida. Surrounded by destruction, she set up a youth corner at her clinic as a nurse to educate patients on the links between climate disasters and health. Or another story, the 24-year-old Sidia Chusasungu in Maputo. She organized a youth movement called United for Baira to ship relief items to affected regions after road connections were lost. These are the stories of real action, real solidarity that are captured in the report. These are the actions of individuals that should inspire us all to step up today because the window of opportunity for adaptation, the window, is closing fast. Why? Because the level of climate change in Africa in the next 10 years, taking us to 1.5 degrees, is locked in. Far more drastic cuts between now and then could enable us to hold the line at 1.5, but 1.5 is locked in. But even, even if the Paris Climate Agreement goals are achieved, which is not a given, the economic cost of climate change in Africa will be enormous. Africa will suffer higher GDP losses than most other regions. These impacts, these economic impacts, can only be reduced with adaptation. Africa needs to scale up adaptation now. If Africa had been prepared with resilient economies and communities to the damaging weather e events of the last decade, the strong growth rates countries such as Kenya had achieved before the COVID pandemic would have been higher. But at the same time, 
If the Paris Agreement goals are missed, if the world warms up to two degrees, three degrees, four degrees or beyond, the economic and social costs for Africa will be catastrophic. Our analysis finds that Africa will suffer significant economic costs over the next couple of decades at several percentage points of GDP per year. But there are silver linings in that Africa has experienced less fatalities in recent years due to climate disasters. Less fatalities. However, the economic cost to Africa of climate catastrophe keeps climbing. Climate change, though, is not just about losses, but also macroeconomic risk. It will affect, and I'm, I'm sure the minister will speak to this, it will affect public finances by requir requiring increased public expenditure and government debt, as well as by reducing government revenues. All of this will affect fiscal stability. The risk also encompass the private sector, losses on assets and higher operating costs, as well as lower revenues. All this can affect and will affect, if we don't adapt, cash flow and company performance. Finally, climate change is a new and significant pressure on the sovereign credit ratings of African countries. As impacts increase, if we don't adapt effectively, these will increase the cost of borrowing. And that would reduce the continent's investment potential. And as these economic costs come from climate change, it is again, that's my central message, it's only adaptation that can reduce them in Africa for the next dec decade. So let us be clear, the poor, in Africa. The poor in Africa cannot afford these impacts. Why? What is certain is that climate change, it will and is disproportionately impacting the poorest and most vulnerable in Africa. Impacts within countries will be uneven, hitting the poorest and most vulnerable the hardest. In fact, worldwide, climate change, if unchecked, will push 122 million new people into extreme poverty by 2030, 122 million people. Of these, in Sub-Saharan sub Africa alone, 43 million new poor people pushed into poverty by climate change. And even if development is rapid and inclusive, up to 12 million people in Africa could be pushed into poverty in this time due to climate change alone. Poverty, of course, is linked it's closely linked with security, with displacement. And half of the African countries today considered highly vulnerable to climate change, half of them are also considered fragile or even extremely fragile. And as the poor in these fragile states are hit harder, climate change will affect the security and the stability of Africa. In West Africa, by 2050, by 2050, in a worst case scenario, we could see 50 million additional internal climate migrants. With effective adaptation though, we can reduce that number by threefold. This is why it remains vital that adaptation efforts do not forget the most vulnerable groups. The small enterprises, business in Africa cannot afford the impacts of climate change either. All of the small and medium enterprises we interviewed in West Africa, all of them, they said they're already today affected by climate change. 70% of those we infected, we interviewed here in East Africa gave the same answer. Three quarters faced lower productivity and sales, three quarters. Half suffered physical damage to their equipment. So our report has one, one main message. If you read this report, you need to keep one main message in your mind. If the world stays within 1.5 degree world, if it stays within 1.5, adaptation in Africa is not only possible, we can do this, it makes imminent economic sense. It is the smartest thing to do, but we must start now and we need to scale up fast. We have we have to make climate adaptation everyone's business. So the results in the State and Trends reports, they're clear. 
Adaptation, climate adaptation, it pays. A dollar invested in weather and climate information services. One dollar gives between four and twenty-five dollars in benefits. A dollar invested in resilient water and sanitation not only saves lives, it creates between two and twelve dollars in benefits. African countries that invest a dollar in climate smart crops can see between two and fourteen dollars in benefits. Adaptation, again, the central message makes economic sense. Well, we also looked at the other side of the coin. What are the costs of inaction? Everybody speaks about the cost of action, but what are the costs of inaction? Well, the solutions to make agriculture more resilient and better adapted to climate change, they're known. So what is the cost of adaptation of agriculture and food system in Africa? What is it? It's around $15 billion per year. So, what are then the costs of inaction if we don't invest uh, those billions? The cost of more frequent and more severe crisis response, disaster relief, recovery pathways, well, it is $200 billion a year, 13 times more. It is, in fact, inaction, not action, inaction that is expensive. So delaying adaptation action will only increase those costs. So we either delay and pay or we take bold action now and here and we prosper. Because let us not forget, Africa, and you know this, those here in this room, those know this, Africa is changing fast. This is an opportunity we must seize. With 43% of its population under the age of 15, 43%, Africa has the largest youth population in the world. Africa's young people today have more education than their parents do. The future of Africa's youth must not be robbed, must not be robbed by climate change. Africa will have more than a third of the global workforce by 2040, with more than one billion citizens ready to work. What does Africa need? More jobs, better jobs, decent jobs, better paid jobs, and adaptation can and should be part of the solution. Africa's massive endowment of nature can be harnessed as an engine for green jobs for adaptation. African cities are changing fast too. Sub-Saharan African cities are growing the fastest in the world. About 40% of Africa's population lives in urban areas, and it will double in absolute numbers by 2050. An important challenge, though, of this number is that 60% of African's urban residents, 60% live in low-income, unplanned communities. About half of African cities are located in the lowest elevation coastal zones. So as sea levels rises, the risk of floods and coastal erosion get increase. So at 40% urbanization today, Africa has the advantage that most of its cities are still to be built, and they can be built resilient and adapted to a rapidly changing climate. And we have a choice here, again, to avoid the mistakes of other cities worldwide. So against this backdrop, we asked ourselves, we asked ourselves in the State and Trends Report, what are the most critical foundations for a sustainable and resilient African growth? Let me start with two, infrastructure and women. First, infrastructure. Africa needs resilient and adapted infrastructure, lots of it. Many claim that resilient infrastructure is expensive and unaffordable. Well, on average, resilient infrastructure is only 3% more expensive, provided you plan it well upstream and build it flexibly. What is expensive, though, is to build and rebuild bridges and dikes after the floods. What is expensive is to face power cuts when hydropower dams dry out. Let's turn to women. Second, African countries are not capitalizing to take advantage of the unique knowledge, skills, and perspectives that women have. Women's knowledge, many of them here in this room, your knowledge about agriculture, traditional multicropping, livestock management, 
is indispensable for climate adaptation, and particularly for climate smart agriculture. African women are the true leaders in the recovery of families after disasters. African women need to be empowered to make the continent resilient and prosperous. After all, 10 years ago, and when I was in Kisumu, taught this to me, African women need to be in the driver's seat. And many positive changes are happening in all corners of the continent. But to unlock its full potential, we must have financing flow at scale. So how much is needed? How much is needed for adaptation? Based on 40 African countries that calculated their adaptation investment needs, that number is in the order of 331 billion through 2030. That's roughly 33 billion a year. So how much is coming to Africa now from the global north? About 6 billion in 2017 and 2018. So if this trend continues, Africa would just see 66 billion by 2030. So, but there are some bright spots. The Multilateral Development Bank, African Development Bank, World Bank, others, their finance grew from 3.6 to 4.7 billion last year versus 2019. However, in the broader perspective, this is still far short of the 331 billion. Remember that number, 331 billion, what is needed. So this adaptation investment needs, it needs to be mobilized from a wider variety of finance sources, where the private sector, the private sector is key. So we need to be focused very focused with the limited public resources we have to orient them for maximum leverage of the private sector. The private sector generates 70% of economic output, 90% of economic growth and employment. But again, most private sector climate activities are focused on mitigation, not on adaptation. And this has to change. We are fighting, as a second key message, we are fighting a battle on two fronts. Climate change has absolutely ceased to be a question of reducing emissions alone. Addressing, particularly here in Africa, addressing growing climate impacts is as important for the world today. And at the same time, access to finance is the biggest barrier to African small and medium enterprises. This was the finding of our major GCA survey conducted with the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. Because adaptation is also a win-win for the private sector. And it's a major business opportunity. Climate adaptation finance can also, not be boost, can also be boosted through innovative financing, leveraging pandemic stimulus financing, and focus on trade. For example, innovations in finance like climate for debt swaps, that enable restructuring of debt to support resilience can unlock significant new resources for action. The huge, the huge public stimulus to COVID-19, it needs to focus as much as possible on a green and resilient recovery. And we can learn from Kenya. Kenya is a great example with some of the highest proportion of green spending in its pandemic stimulus. Other African nations would do well to follow that lead of Kenya. And finally, promoting trade. I just referenced it. Trade provides a cushion for shocks to food security, for example, or by ensuring supply of staples can meet demand when local production is hit. By leveraging comparative advantages over time, trade in resilient goods and services will also create more jobs in our economies. We need to also consider enabling conditions, enabling conditions set by governments. All of our research shows that good climate risk and resilience data, it's vital for investments. Likewise, if we're going to increase, if we're going to increase financial flows by multiples, by multiple factors, we have to build capacity 
of Africa, financial institutions and government entities to mobilize these resilient investments. African governments are also saying they're ready to contribute. Based on an analysis of the 15 current NDCs, the plans for Glasgow, that provide a breakdown of cost estimates, African countries are willing to put down close to 20% of funding for adaptation if the world comes forward with the rest. So if the world mobilizes 24 billion a year, 18 billion more than the 6 billion that has been coming today, African countries on average indicate that they could mobilize 6 billion a year. Because quite frankly, the Vice Chancellor, you indicated this, Africa has very little responsibility. President um, Kenyatta indicated this. Historically, or in the present day, for global greenhouse gas emissions compared to other major regions of the world. But can the world, will the world, mobilize this funding? It was precisely this reason, with the African Development Bank, that we joined forces to design the landmark Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program, AAAP. And unlike other adaptation plans in Africa, the AAAP is not only comprehensive, it also addresses the nexus between climate change and impacts, COVID-19, and the economy. So the AAAP will support all African countries in designing and implementing transformational adaptation of their economies and post-COVID recovery development pathways. What's very important, the AAAP is an Africa-owned, Africa-led response. Africa leaders have asked for this program and have endorsed this design, including an upstream facility led by the GCA, which supports investment pipeline development and other upstream work. And this is also in addition to a downstream investment facility, which is led by the African Development Bank and directly finances adaptation projects. The AAAP is the translation of the Africa Adaptation Initiative, AAI. And it translates it into actual projects and actual programs on the ground for people. This is a people agenda. So the AAAP focuses on four bold pillars where urgent action is needed and where investments in adaptation can yield high dividends. So a sense of scale. The program is mobilizing 25 billion in resources to support 30 million African smallholders and reduce malnutrition for at least 10 million people. It will support 1 million youth with entrepreneurship skills and job creation. The African Development Bank, under the leadership, under the extraordinary leadership, I have to say, of President Akin Adesina, has already committed half of the total. $12.5 billion is there. Together with all African uh, nations, we are mobilizing the additional 12.5 billion US dollars. Because, big picture, adaptation represents only 21% of climate finance flows from developed countries to the development world, 21% only. And the developed world committed to deliver $100 billion in balanced flows to adaptation and mitigation every year between 2020 and 2025. So the Glasgow COP, a few days from now, it must deliver on this commitment. For AAAP, what does it mean? We expect, we hope, we need six to eight billion US dollars will be mobilized at COP26. And the remaining balance will be mobilized next year, COP27, at the Africa Summit. Glasgow. Glasgow must show that the world cares about Africa's adaptation. That is why we're convening, together with President Kenyatta, together with President Chisikedi on behalf of the African Union, together with President Bongo, with all African leaders and the G20 leaders and the Nordic uh, Prime Ministers. 
we are convening the largest ever Adaptation for Africa Summit next week, November 2nd, in Glasgow. It will showcase the continent's many solutions which are ready to scale up. But Glasgow must, in return, deliver for Africa. In closing, I want to refer back to where I began with Akin, Akinji, An, in Kisumu. In her language, in your language, in Luo, Akinji, it means born in the morning. And I believe we are at the sunrise of an adaptation revolution for Africa. However, right now, Today, this continent is truly at the crossroads. And adapt or die might sound too strong for some. And yet, thousands of lives, millions of livelihoods have already been sacrificed in Africa due to inadequate adaptation. But Anne, in a small village, close to Kisumu gives us hope because adaptation is not the right thing to do only. It is, again, the smartest thing to do. The opportunity is here, is for the taking. Let us seize it. I thank you. Wow. I know we can give him a bigger round well, of applause than that. Mm -hmm. What a thought-provoking um, statement and case that has been made for adaptation in Africa. I couldn't think of more. I've been jotting down notes to just try and get all of these takeaways, and there are many. Start now, scale up fast, and that investment in adaptation pays and it does make economic sense. And thank you so much um, you know, for capturing the findings and the recommendations of that State and Trends in Adaptation in Africa 2021 report um, and for painting the picture that it is extremely urgent for adaptation to happen. And that's why it's not just adaptation, but accelerated adaptation. And that is what we're here discussing today. GCA Africa Adaptation Acceleration Day. Um, and so thank you very much, uh, Professor, for those um, thought-provoking words and also backing that up with statistics and what happens if we, you know, just basically lay and die in action is not something that we are um, definitely able to afford to have. Um, Listen, there's a lot of great insights that are coming up here. And if you want to share them with everybody who's not in the room, please go online. You can do that. The hashtag we're using online is hashtag STA21. And you can tag GCA at GC Adaptation. It's at GC Adaptation. That is online on Twitter. Thank you very much for that. Now, um, let's listen to some five global leaders who are joining us live here today from across the world. And these are leaders who um, are driving the adaptation agenda on the continent. And we would like to hear what their thoughts are um, to all of us who are gathered here and those of us online. And as you can see, they are here joining me uh, to have this conversation and give us their thoughts and reflections on the same. First up, I'd like us all, ladies and gentlemen, to hear from His Excellency Ban Ki-moon, who is the 8th UN Secretary General and also the Chair of the Global Center on Adaptation. Your Excellency Ban Ki-moon, thank you for joining us. Please speak to us and give us your vision. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Okawara, for your very kind introduction. And uh, Your Excellency, President Uhura Kenyatta of Kenya, and thank you for your strong leadership and commitment uh, to uh, lead not only your country, Kenya, but also Africa with a strong commitment to fight against the climate change. And I'd like to also uh, commend the leadership of uh, CEO, Dr. Patrick Faircoyen for his um, very inspiring speech and strong commitment for his leadership. And I'm also, uh, very happy to be uh, with uh, the leaders of um, uh, World Bank uh, and IMF and also uh, African Development Bank 
world trading uh, organizations and also UNFCCC. And I'm very happy to work with all these global leaders. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Back in 2007, that was the first year as the Secretary General. I was the first Secretary General of the United Nations to visit Antarctica. In a small plane, I flew over melting ice fields. I could see vast chunks of ice the size of six-story buildings breaking away from ice shelves. Then I continued to visit the Arctic four times. The power of nature was impressive and extraordinarily beautiful. But the journey was deeply disturbing and because it was a proof climate change was accelerating faster than we thought. I had sent out strong, strongest possible messages to the people of the world and particularly leaders of the world that climate change was happening much, much faster than we have thought. And here I am, 14 years later, and what is happening now is worse than I could have ever imagined, particularly for those living on the front lines on the African continent. And we have no one but ourselves to blame. The recent IPCC report affirms that again, the human influence is to blame and some forms of climate disruption have now been locked in for centuries. We have no choice but to act and adapt, act to cut carbon emissions as fast as we can to reduce the burden on adaptation and adapt to growing climate impact that we being experienced the world over. To secure people's lives and livelihoods, to secure a climate resilient future for everyone. We have just less than a week to go until COP26 in Glasgow. The time for talk is over and truly over. We have to deliver on the promises of Paris climate change agreement where we are failing. This means, first, there must be delivery of $100 billion in climate finance, as Dr. Fair Cohen has just mentioned, for every year from 2020 until 2025 at least, with a parity between mitigation and adaptation. If there is to be any confidence and trust in global cooperation to address the climate emergency, I'm urging that there should be 50 to 50% 50 allocations of financial support for mitigation and adaptation. Second, we must have every country aligning their ambition upwards towards 1.5 degrees, a limit beyond which we cannot allow the Earth to go. Three, we must bring adaptation to climate change onto a level footing with emission cuts. The climate emergency is already all around us and no one is safe. COVID-19 has taught us that we are only as strong as our weakest link. That is why international efforts must be global. Everyone, every nation, every boardroom, every courthouse, every dinner table, every schoolyard can and must contribute to the solution. It is nothing short of the biggest challenge of our time, but we can do it. Adaptation will take on many shapes and forms all over this globe. As a new international organization, the Global Center on Adaptation, GCA, with Dr. Patrick Fercoyen at its helm, is a key resource for adapting our world. 
The state and trends in adaptation 2021 Africa report published by the GCA is the most comprehensive adaptation report on Africa where adaptation is most needed. This report does not just present a gloomy picture of the future, but it identifies opportunities to invest in adaptation across all key economic sectors, as well as the positive returns on such investment to speed up the achievement of the SDGs in Africa. The Africa-led and Africa-owned Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program, AAAP, jointly developed by the GCA and the African Development Bank, is an opportunity to realize this ambition, delivering a resilient and prosperous future for Africa, as called for by all African leaders. The AAAP, as Africa's plan, seeks to mobilize $25 billion in five years to deliver action on four bold ideas that will upscale and accelerate adaptation on the front. First, digital agriculture resilient. Second, resilient infrastructure. Third, youth employment and entrepreneurship. And fourth, innovative finance. And of course, $25 billion over five years is a drop in the ocean compared to the challenges Africa faces. But it is the floor, not the ceiling, for adaptation finance. The African Development Bank has already committed $12.5 billion of this money. Our goal is to raise the remaining $12.5 billion as a due and additional finance between now and COP27, split midway. As called by, by President Shisekedi of Democratic Republic of Congo, in his capacity as African Union leader, all partners need to come to Glasgow to commit to AAAP as its aims are realistic, necessary, and achievable. This is Africa's ask. This is Africa's imperative. Now the international community must respond to that. Therefore, to support the African continent in its transition towards a green, resilient recovery, I call on all leaders and development partners to capitalize AAAP upstream financing facility with 250 million euros over five years at COP26 next week in Glasgow. These resources are essential to unlock the billions of, to shift the trillions on the continent. Ladies and gentlemen, I also strongly support the leadership of African Development Bank to establish AAAP investment facility to finance the scale up and acceleration of adaptation on the African continent. The facility will be key vehicle to channel part of the $100 billion annually meant for adaptation and resilience building in Africa in the years to come. Here today, I would like to emphasize that we are starting a new chapter for Africa, an opportunity for the continent to build forward better and build greener. But for Africa to turn this plan into reality, Glasgow has to deliver on adaptation for the continent. Only together can we thrive and prosper. Thank you very much for your leadership and attention. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Mr. Secretary General, for your remarks and indeed for just reminding us that the time for talk is over and it is truly over. And for also just reiterating what we heard from uh, Professor Fakoyan um, telling us about that this is not just about painting a gloomy picture, but it's also about identifying the opportunities that exist for Africa when it comes to adaptation. And some very good things we're hearing as we head towards COP26 in Glasgow in the next few days. Ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, please allow me to introduce our next global leader to speak to us today, and that is the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kristalina Georgieva. Thank you so very much for including me in today's discussion. Uh, President Kenyatta, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, Excellencies, colleagues and dear, dear friends. I want to start by first recognizing that we are very fortunate to gather on the birthday of President Kenyatta, so very many happy returns uh, on this day. Uh, and uh, to uh, recognize that uh, Kenya has stepped forward in this crisis uh, in a way that provides uh, more security to its people uh, but also lessons for others. Uh, our discussion is centered on a critical topic for Africa, adaptation to climate change. The Global Center for um, Adaptation uh, and, and the partners uh, they have are right to focus on Africa's adaptation as we approach COP26. Why? Because we all know it, climate change puts at risk Africa's substantial economic and development progress over the past decade, as the continent faces a market increase in the frequency and intensity of natural disasters, higher temperatures, and of course, for coastal Africa, rising sea levels. This is particularly concerning at the time when the COVID pandemic has already had a severe economic impact, job losses, reduced income for so many, debt levels up, uneven access to vaccines, reduced fiscal space that threatens to hold back the recovery. And we know that for Africa, climate shocks are particularly troubling because resilience to shocks remains low coping mechanisms in so many places are weak. So growth, jobs, food security are threatened, especially where people depend on rain-fed agriculture. As today's uh, 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 report rightly says, for Africa, climate adaptation is a necessity. It is not a choice. And adapting to climate change must go hand in hand with reducing poverty improving livelihoods, raising living standards. From our perspective, there are three priorities for action, and they are priorities that press urgency on us to act. First, we must strengthen ex-ante resilience to climate shocks. It means investing in climate-smart agriculture, resilient infrastructure, boosting food security, with better irrigation systems to reduce reliance on rainfall, better access to agricultural research and climate resilient seeds, better roads and storage combined with trade reforms that promote commerce and get products to market in good time, including across borders. This also means investing in resilient people through adequate access to vaccinations right now and in the future, through good healthcare, but also through investing in education and technology. So African can have accurate weather forecasts in the hands of farmers. So farmers' productivity and the quality and speed of food distribution all improve. Broader access to finance can help households invest in their own resilience efforts. Second priority, strong preparedness, strong coping mechanisms, 
to attenuate the impact of climate events. Uh, we have seen the value of social assistance, such as cash transfers, access to finance. They act as buffer when a disaster strikes, helping people, businesses, and communities to cope. Uh, and, and that was very visible over the last uh, year. We saw how cash and in-kind transfers provided households and workers essential goods and how digital technology helped people receive money quickly. And that brings me to my third priority. We need to urgently unlock climate financing for adaptation. We at the IMF estimate that at least two to 3% of regional GDP, this is 30 to $50 billion, is needed each year over the next decade to accelerate adaptation efforts in sub-Saharan Africa. Countries need to do their part by mobilizing revenues, improving spending efficiency, but that is not going to be enough. They need external support to cover the bulk of the financing needs. The international community ought to deliver on its annual commitment to provide $100 billion per year in climate finance to developing countries. And within this $100 billion, we ought to prioritize uh, for sub-Saharan Africa investment in adaptation. We also need greater financing by the private sector. The IMF on the house side are doing our part at this critical moment in human history. We are putting climate at the heart of our work. Uh, to leverage the recently uh, uh, allocated $650 billion uh, special drawing rights, we are in the process of develop developing a new resilience and sustainability trust to help low and vulnerable middle income countries make important reforms, including increasing climate resilience. We have days to COP26 in Glasgow. We all know it is a historic opportunity for the world to recognize that past inaction has made adaptation a necessity. And armed with this knowledge, we must urgently move towards stopping the dangerous accumulation of CO2 emissions and avoid an even worse situation. Put simply, the more mitigation we do, the less adaptation we need. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gergieva, Gergieva um, and for your leadership in making climate central to the work of the IMF. We appreciate your time and your insights um, and for the work that you are doing in this space. Now, you have heard of the work that has happened um, towards the Triple AP, and that is together with the GCA. It's now time for us to hear from uh, our next leader, who is the president of the African Development Bank Group, His Excellency Dr. Akinmu. Mumi Adeshina, who is the president once again of the AFDB. Mr. President, the floor is yours. Please speak to us. Your Excellences, with only a few days to go until the world comes together in Glasgow for COP26, there couldn't be a better moment to present Africa's climate needs to the world. A year ago, the Global Center on Adaptation and the African Development Bank joined forces and launched the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program called AAAP. We are mobilizing $25 billion to scale up climate change adaptation actions and drive investments in green growth. Because the time for action is now. AAAP is built on four pillars. First, agriculture. We will scale up access to climate smart digital technologies and associated data-driven agricultural and financial services to at least 30 million farmers in Africa. Second, infrastructure. We will ensure that climate risk and resilience are integrated in at least 50% of total value of new infrastructure investments in Africa across all infrastructure sectors. Third, youth. 
We will promote sustainable job creation through entrepreneurship in climate adaptation and resilience by unlocking $3 billion in credit for adaptation action. Fourth, innovative financial initiatives. We will increase financial flows for adaptation and resilience with a total increase of adaptation finance on the continent to over $5 billion per year by 2025. We say, we do, we deliver. Ladies and gentlemen, $25 billion may seem like a lot of money, but it's actually not enough to meet Africa's adaptation needs, which are estimated to be $7 billion to $15 billion per year. The AAAP provides a unique opportunity for wealthier nations to meet their commitments and help Africa to tackle the consequences of climate change. I am optimistic that our partners will deliver the first round of financing of $6 billion to $8 billion that we need for the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program in 2021. I call upon you to support the Global Center on Adaptation and the African Development Bank in our efforts to unlock more essential funding for adaptation. Several years ago, the world's wealthier nations pledged to mobilize $100 billion a year by 2020 to help developing countries cope with the effects of climate change. It's time to finally deliver on that promise. Our continent, the least contributor to global emissions, cannot and should not bear the burden of climate change alone. Now we are all in this together. Together we can. And we must collectively mobilize the resources. Together, we will overcome the monumental challenges ahead of us. Together, with visionary leadership, we will find our ways towards a climate resilient future. I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, for speaking to us on that one. And indeed, um, $25 billion may seem like a lot of money. It is not, and that is why we're looking towards more commitment and our eyes and the eyes of the world trained to Glasgow. COP26 in the next few days. And that is where I want us to go so that we can listen to our next leader here on our program this afternoon or this morning, wherever you could be joining us from around the world. It is to Glasgow we go, and it is to speak to the Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC, Your Excellency Patricia Espinoza. Your Excellency, please speak to us all the way from Glasgow. That's correct. Greetings from Glasgow. It's really a pleasure to participate in this very important day for adaptation and accelerating the pace of resilience building in Africa. I want to um, uh, greet uh, President Kenyatta, also to take advantage of this opportunity to wish him all the best for his birthday and in the coming years uh, to come. I'm particularly honored and humbled to be able to join this uh, amazing group of uh, world leaders, um, uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, um, uh, my dear friend, Kristalina uh, uh, Georgieva from the IMF, uh, um, the uh, President Adesina from the African Development Bank, and of course, um, uh, Dr. Patrick Verhoegen, uh, who is really behind uh, making all of this possible. So thank you all for your leadership and commitment because we need all the efforts in order to make the COP26 here in Glasgow a success. So this year's focus on your side, on Africa, provides the most comprehensive overview of the present and projected climate risks to date. It also provides an excellent blueprint for adaptation actions for the African continent in the face of climate change. And this work is coming at a key moment as the speakers before me have already underlined, because we are just days away from COP26. Actually, 
I am already here in Glasgow waiting for all of you. And success here is crucial. Nations here at COP26 must bridge existing differences, complete their outstanding agenda, work towards fully implementing the Paris Agreement, and continue to build climate action. Adaptation is key to the delivery of a successful COP26, and there are several areas of focus. The Paris Agreement provides the globally agreed framework for the fight against climate change, and it is important that all efforts are aligned to support that framework. National adaptation plans are key instruments under the Paris Agreement, and those plans are the main international instrument for adaptation planning and implementation. We need nations to consolidate and strengthen those plans. COP26 is their opportunity to do it. So far, only 26 NAPs have been formulated. However, the good news is that at least 125 out of 154 developing countries have already initiated work on their national adaptation plans and the Green Climate Fund is already actively supporting that work. But much more needs to be done. That's where the momentum on adaptation is with the national adaptation plans. And that's where international support for adaptation should be. Most of the least developed countries are in Africa. So advancing support to Africa on national adaptation plans will be a huge contribution to global efforts supporting adaptation. Now is the time for focus. Now is the time for unity of purpose. We all need to boost communications around adaptation, resilience, and what that means with respect to the impacts of climate change. This subject, especially with respect to recent climate emergencies, will only grow in importance. In that vein, National Climate Action Plans, or NDCs, are also an opportunity to inform the international community about the vision and goals identified in national adaptation plans. We encourage all nations to complete both their NAPs and to submit robust and ambitious NDCs as rapidly as possible. Key to success in adaptation and resilience like so many other issues related to climate change. And this has also been already underlined by uh, all the speakers that have preceded me, is adequate finance. For COP26, we have been calling for wider ranging and comprehensive financial support for developing nations. Just yesterday, the COP26 presidency released the 100 billion delivery plan led by Canada's Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Jonathan Wilkinson, and Germany's State Secretary at the Ministry for Environment, Nature, Conservation, and Nuclear Safety of Germany, Jochen Flassbach. According to this plan, the outlook to 2025 shows progress towards 2022 and provides confidence that the 100 billion goal will be met from 2023. We cannot understate it. Without the necessary support, we will not be able to embark in the transformations needed to achieve the 1.5 degree goal. And this is not only about the 100 billion. We need to mobilize the trillions. We will continue to call for balance of the total share of public climate finance provided by all developed countries and multilateral development banks to be allocated to adaptation and resilience. It's important to note that Africa is a global leader with respect to adaptation financing. We have just heard President Adesina how much he is working together with his team in putting the plans together, in making a clear projection of what are the needs of Africa. So I really hope that the support for 
um, the African Development Bank will be forthcoming and that the, all the other international financial institutions will also follow this example. Uh, what is happening now under President Adesina's leadership is a good beginning, the kind of leadership we need to see globally. I want to also recognize the leadership by Kristalina uh, Georgieva at the head of the IMF and uh, recognize the way that he ha she has been promoting this agenda within the finance community, which is not an easy task. So thank you very much also to Kristalina for all your leadership and uh, your uh, uh, drive. This leadership, must reflect why adaptation must be discussed with the same urgency as mitigation. As the impacts of extreme weather become more and more evident and nowhere more so than in Africa, this is no longer an issue up for debate. The climate emergency is here and we need solutions now. Dear colleagues, excellencies, the next weeks will be critical for the success of our collective climate change efforts in Africa and throughout the world with respect to adaptation, finance, and mitigation. Your input and in this report is vital to that success. I can assure you not only of UN climate change's ongoing support, but that I will bring forth this information to leaders here in Glasgow. I once again thank you for this incredibly important work, for your leadership, and I would like to count on your support uh, here in Glasgow. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Espinoza, and for your personal um, you know, commitment to that as well. And I'm sure the world looks forward to meeting you in Glasgow in the next few days. Thank you very much um, for your role in this. And now we want to hear from a strong African voice that joins us now, leading uh, the World Trade Organization as Director General. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my pleasure to invite Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iweala to speak to us from the World Trade Organization. Madam? Well, th thank you so much uh, for, for having me and on this very important occasion. I really want to congratulate uh, uh, Dr. Patrick Vewian and uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta for the launch of this, and His Excellency Ban Ki-moon. It's a fantastic event, a fantastic day. I also want to congratulate my brother, Dr. Aki Adeshina, for the way that he has taken on this challenge and put forward the resources or part of the resources needed to make this a reality. I, today, I'd like to make uh, four, four points on trade and climate. But the, the first one is really that um, we, we should think adaptation and we must prioritize it in our response to the climate emergence. Last month, the scientific community confirmed what most of us already know, climate change is here. It is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean and land, and that global surface temperatures will continue to increase until at least the mid century. Global efforts to address the climate emergency must equally focus on climate mitigation and climate adaptation. Indeed, failure to adapt to climate change and build resilience will lead to a devastating loss of life and livelihoods around the world, worse than what we have seen in this COVID-19 pandemic. And I think that Patrick laid it out very clearly what this will mean for Africa. We must therefore mainstream climate adaptation and resilience into every sector and every decision we make. Let me again congratulate the Global Center for Adaptation for its significant contribution to accelerate action and support for adaptation solutions. The World Trade Organization looks forward to working closely with you at the GCA, with governments and other partners to support these objectives. I was very pleased that the WTO Secretariat for the first time has contributed a chapter on trade to the state and trends in adaptation in Africa report 2020. 
This, I hope, is just the start of the collaboration between the WTO and the Global Center for Adaptation. Adaptation to climate change must be a priority for every government, every organization, and, and putting in place the relevant policy frameworks, including for trade, uh, to reflect all of this. The WTO can make a significant contribution uh, to, to, to the climate agenda in three areas that will be crucial to buttress our climate adaptation efforts at the upcoming COP26 and beyond. The first is ensuring that supply chains are resilient, and this should be a key component of countries' adaptation strategies. International trade and supply chains are an insurance policy against climate risks and must form part of national adaptation strategies. Open trade is indispensable to cushion against and adapt to the negative impacts of climate change. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown that global supply chains are a source of strength, not weakness. However, supply chains are also vulnerable to disruption as we see. It is therefore imperative that we make global supply chains as resilient as possible so we can withstand the changes in our climate system. Making supply chains resilient will require global effort to climate-proof transport and other key trade-related infrastructure. To cope with heat and humidity extremes, multiple locations around the world, including in Africa, will require substantial investment in transport, as well as energy and communications infrastructure. The same can be said about seaports coping with rising sea levels. The WTO-led Aid for Trade initiative can help mobilize investment in climate-resilient infrastructure. Aid for trade to build energy, transport, and telecommunications infrastructure amounted to $25 billion in 2019, representing 55% of overall aid for trade disbursements. This is an opportunity we must seize for building resilience. Strengthening regional integration and supply chains for further bolsters against climate risks through economic diversification. Putting all our eggs in one basket is not a recipe for agility or resilience. Investment in regional value chains and regional trade provides opportunities to diversify trade, share tasks, and manage adaptation challenges. For instance, as climate change causes crop yields to fall, open and reliable agricultural trade will be crucial for hunger-affected and import-dependent regions, such as certain parts of the continent. There is therefore an opportunity to achieve the twin goals of economic integration and climate resilience through investment in climate-proof transport and connectivity infrastructure. My second point is that climate adaptation plans need to rely on trade liberalization to ensure that every climate finance dollar goes further. The WTO can help lower barriers to trade for goods, services, and technologies that are essential for adaptation. Lowering trade barriers helps to stretch each dollar of adaptation finance further. This makes it more affordable to invest in cutting edge technologies for addressing risks from sea level rise, drought, extreme weather events and floods or for climate proofing infrastructure. In a similar way during the pandemic, we have seen WTO members streamline their trade policies to speed up access to essential medical supplies like vaccines. If we focus on Africa, eliminating barriers to trade in adaptation goods and services would significantly reduce the cost of meeting the continent's adaptation priorities. To give an example, import tariffs levied on goods relevant to adaptation, we have an illustrative list of 56 of these goods, average close to 10% in many African countries, with tariffs sometimes going as high as 50% in some countries. In terms of Africa's energy security, 70% of Africa's energy is generated through hydropower, which is exposed to significant climate risks. Meanwhile, the whole of Nigeria, Africa's largest economy, my country, has an installed capacity uh, for, for uh, electricity uh, that is uh, almost equivalent to, to what we have at uh, London Heathrow. First, trade opening must be used as part of the solution for diversifying and enhancing low-carbon energy supply 
in Africa. My third point is that international cooperation must be intensified to ensure that climate adaptation efforts are effective and widespread. And the WTO stands ready to contribute to this objective. Governments across the world must join forces with all the relevant stakeholders, including the private sector and civil society, to put in place comprehensive adaptation strategies. In this context, we should ensure that trade policies are fully aligned with climate adaptation strategies. Trade and the WTO have a key role to play here in delivering affordable and accessible climate adaptation solutions. Indeed, the WTO promotes stable and predictable global trade to speed up dissemination of adaptation technologies. WTO monitors and enhances transparency of supply chains, which facilitates trade and investment and enables the smooth flow of needed goods and services. We can use the WTO's Aid for Trade initiative to marshal investments in climate resilient infrastructure. We meet at a crossroads for climate change and trade. COP26 and the WTO's 12th Ministerial Conference will both take place in the coming weeks. COP26 is an opportunity to make great strides in building global adaptation capacity. The blueprint for adaptation actions for the African continent set out in this report is vitally important, and trade and the WTO can help realize these goals. We look forward to working with you. In turn, at the WTO's 12th Ministerial Conference, WTO members are working on various initiatives to promote the role of trade in addressing climate change and other environmental challenges. Both venues will allow us to make trade a force for climate adaptation. The WTO stands ready to continue serving the international community in the fight against climate change. Thank you. And uh, it's been an honor to join you. Thank you. It has indeed been an honor for us to have you with us. Thank you, Dr. Iweala, and thank you as well to our global leaders. We cannot thank you enough for your time here and the commitments that you are making towards accelerated adaptation for Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, it is now time for our global press conference uh, that we're having here. And at this point, I'd like to invite uh, back on stage for this, uh, Dr. Patrick Vakoyan uh, to come up here and uh, answer some of the questions. We have our members of the press who are here, um, some of them colleagues of mine, um, and I'm looking forward to the questions um, that they will have for you. So um, let's move into that now. And um, just to let you know how this will go, um, we would like you to uh, step up to the aisle. We have our hostesses who will be here providing you with the microphone. Please let us know your name and the media house that you represent to be able to um, answer this, um, to have your questions answered. Uh, and remember, we have our global leaders here as well. So any questions you would like addressed to them. Dr. McCoyan, yes. yes. So um, we of course have our global leaders here. So any questions that you would have addressed to them as well, please put your hand up um, when you want to ask your question so that um, we can then have you ask your question. So. Who would like to go first? Yes, uh, madam, in the red jacket. Could you please step up um, into the aisle? Or can you pass the microphone over? Yes, please step into the aisle. Thank you. So you can make it. And remember your name and the media house you represent. And it's not just Dr. Vakoyan who is here. We've got our global leaders as well. So you can address uh, your questions to them and they will be happy to answer. If there's anybody else, um, then you can please just uh, line up behind uh, uh, the good lady so that we can then uh, move it along. I'd like to take a couple of questions first and then we can answer them. Go ahead, please. Yes, my name is Judith Akolo. I work for the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation. I'm also a student here at the University of Nairobi, a Master of Climate Change and Adaptation student. My question goes to the CEO of GCA. Uh, you've spoken well about um, ensuring that we adapt to climate change, but looking at the requirements that uh, countries need 
for them to access the green climate funding. It's quite tedious and uh, it, it might make it really difficult for countries to access this funding because I'm looking at a situation where Africa has a problem with scientific data on climate. So when there is such a requirement, then it, it actually means that Africa cannot access this funding because then you're being asked to make sure that the, re, the proposal is grounded on scientific data that is collected by those particular countries in Africa, data that is non-existent. So my question is this, how else can African countries then access this funding to be able to invest in adaptation measures? Thank you. Do we have another or shall we have? Yes, please. Um, please step up. Sarah? Is that you, Sarah? No, I need to hold the mic. Okay, can I go? Is that you, Sarah Kimani? Yes, sure. Yeah, yeah, Sarah Kimani from SABC, please. That's fine. I'm sorry. Just Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Kemani. I work with the South African Broadcasting Corporation uh, based here in Nairobi. My question goes to you, sir, the CEO of uh, GCA, as well as uh, to the former UNSG. I would like to find out um, one of the things that is coming out from leaders that we have spoken to, they're saying that uh, when the climate fund comes to Africa, it is actually turned into debt. And so they're finding that uh, they're more indebted and a lot of them now see it as a load that they cannot be able to, to continue holding. What is your opinion on this? And is this true? Okay, great. Um, thank you. Perhaps um, if you'll allow me, Dr. Verkoyen, we can have um, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon respond to that and then we will come back to you um, just so that we have uh, the opportunity to hear from him. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, I don't know if you had a chance to hear Sarah Kimani's question regarding um, the funding that comes in, and it comes in in the form of debt, Mr. Secretary General. So may, so may I now answer to that question? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, it is very important that at the time of uh, Paris Climate Change Agreement, there was a firm agreement among the members, particularly OECD countries, the developing countries, that um, they have to go to, together. The climate change does not discriminate whether you are coming from developed or developing countries. And it would be also injustice and unfair when African countries, developing countries, they have not contributed much to climate phenomena. It is mostly by, caused by developed countries in the name of uh, industrialization. Therefore, only the impact, impact has been on the developing, poor developing countries. And that is why there was a firm agreement that um, developed countries would provide $100 billion annually. Uh, first, before, first by 2020, then from thereafter, every year, $100 billion at least by 2025. This has not been made. We have uh, mobilized only $80 billion by the end of 2020. Now it is much more important now that uh, there, should be, there should be this uh, financial as well as a technological support to uh, developing countries, particularly Africa. When uh, we established this uh, GCA, Global Center on Adaptation, this is mainly meant to support African countries. And therefore, my strong urge to the leaders who are coming to um, uh, Glasgow this time, they must, they must again have a roadmap, clear, clear plan, how they are going to mobilize $100 billion and to provide support. This is a very important one. And they must align this ambition towards 1.5 degrees, but this should be supported by the financial and technological support. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary General. Um, and we'll now have uh, Dr. Bakoyan uh, respond to the two questions from both Judith and Sarah. But before you do that, Dr. Bakoyan, I would just like to thank our global leaders. I know it's a busy time for you. In fact, uh, many thanks to Dr. Iweala, who had to leave us. And many thanks as well to you, Dr. Georgieva, uh, from the IMF. Thank you for your time. We cannot appreciate you enough. Yeah, as well as Ms. Espinosa. I want to say Go something ahead. to Kristalina. Go ahead. Uh, Georgieva, it yes. is. I mean, having a global leader at the helm of the International Monetary Fund, being in this case Kristalina Georgieva, is a gift for Africa. And let me tell you why. Mainstreaming physical risk into financial risk is not a given. That's what Kristalina uh, did during her tenure at the IMF. That's what she did before in her previous job at the World Bank, making adaptation finance uh, with mitigation finance on, on, on par. So the proposal and the efforts which were putting, put on the table under her leadership, uh, particularly the $650 billion special drawing rights and the focus of investments on resilience is vitally uh, important also for the success of uh, Glasgow and particularly for um, the future of Africa. So, so, Kristalina, I know you have to go, you have other pressing uh, commitments, but I just want to say thank you also on behalf of the uh, Honourable Minister here with us uh, and other participants here for this uh, global press conference. So thank you very much indeed. Now going back could to... Could I just, uh, could uh, I just and, add, uh, Patrick, uh, thank you very much. Could I thank just you. add to the Secretary General's point that we do need to see more grant financing going for adaptation in Africa? It is paramount that we do not increase debt levels when we are responding to pressing needs. And in that context, the special drawing rights allocation is a way to increase capacity to deal with pressing problems like climate change without adding to the debt of nations. Uh, and that I wholeheartedly support as the first allocation went uh, through, but also as we are aiming to amplify this allocation by getting more of these SDRs to work for Africa. Thank you, Patrick. So, so thank you very much indeed, uh, Christina, and we all wish you well. Now back to Judith and, and, and Sarah. I think these questions were very pertinent. One, it is about um, access to finance. So in my remarks, I referenced access to finance, but I mainly focused on the increase of the scale of financing, right? We need more financing to flow to, to Africa, specific for adaptation. And as Kristalina indicated, and in responding to your point, uh, Sarah, there has to be more grant financing for Africa, not more loans for uh, the problem which you not have cost, but grand finance. And I think that is very important in terms of the quality of the financing flows coming into, um, into Africa. Now on the access point, obviously, when money is coming to Africa and we want more of it, and we need more of it, you need to be able to access it, right? I mean, that, that's sort of a given uh, uh, in and of itself. And what we see today, that access to finance of national institutions, financial institutions in Africa is quite constrained. So within the triple AP, remember the four pillars, and I think the Secretary General spoke about it very comprehensively, President Arasina uh, described them. The fourth pillar is not only about innovative finance, but it's also about the access finance uh, component. So as part of the triple AP, there is a new program called Technical Assistance Program Towards Access to Finance. It means, in essence, that we will support national financial institutions to basically prepare bankable investment proposals which can be sent to the GCF. But then it is at the GCF board. And as you said, uh, uh, Judith, the GCF um, guidelines and sort of decision-making process is way too complicated. So in addition to supporting national financial institutions here on the continent, we need simplified procedures from the GCF to be able to access these finance. So we need more financing. It needs to be grant financing largely, but we need to access it 
at the same time. So with that, I think finance will flow at the scale which is required. But again, also, um, if I may, next week in Glasgow, there is a lot to play for. Patricia Espinoza uh, referenced that earlier today, um, the developed nations launched their um, implementation plan for the 100 billion. And for those journalists here, and those online, and for those students who follow this closely, it's very important to interpret that commitment very carefully. What does it say? It will say that, it says that over five years, i.e. between now and 2025, the 500 billion will be delivered. That is extremely good news. Right. So the donor communities have said today, we will deliver. Message one. Message two is the 100 billion within the 500 billion will be delivered. That amount, it's currently 80, will be delivered comes 2023. So what you will see is as a ramp up of finance in the next few years, but on total, it will be 500 billion. My message to the developed world is this. 500 billion, thank you for the delivery. That's what we need. Make sure that a large part of that goes to Africa. Secondly, make sure that a significant part of that 500 billion, which goes to Africa, is grant financing. And thirdly, let us make sure that of that 500 billion, that the promise of Paris, of the Paris Agreement, which, was, which came under the leadership of Secretary General Ban Ki-moon six years ago, the developed nations promised parity between mitigation finance and adaptation finance. What Africa needs is more adaptation finance. So that is what developed partners need to deliver. And lastly, a week from now, November 2nd, I will be sitting in that room together with Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, together with the Honorable Minister, together with President Kenyatta, and many other African leaders with G20 uh, uh, heads of states and government. Let us use the commitment which we heard today from development, developed partners for the triple AP. That is the metrics of success. Whether those living on the front lines today whether it's on in Kusumu or the replicas of on across the nation and across the continent will really be better off uh, uh, after Glasgow. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Vakoyan, and just and thank you as well to our journalists here in the room and those who are joining us online. I know it's not enough, Sarah. I can see you looking at me. Judith, I can see you want more. I know you do. Uh, and so just to inform you that there will be an opportunity to speak with Professor Vakoyan a little more just outside in a moment. Uh, so you will have your moment to go in depth with uh, a couple of more questions that you have. And as well, our media team here will be organizing with the journalists who are online as well. Professor, thank you very much for your time. You may take your seat. Yes. And so we'll I know that you. my time is up. Yes. Our time is up and I've been spoken way too long. <laughs> this was supposed to be ending an hour ago, but it's one final message for students. Go ahead. Because um, we at the Global Center on Adaptation, we work with governments, of course. We work with the private sector, of course. But it is vitally important that we also build strong collaboration with students, not only in the Netherlands or in the United States, no, students on the African continent. We're here at an extraordinary place, at a very prestigious university on the continent. So it is also my commitment, which I discussed with the Vice Chancellor, that we develop a robust partnership between the University of Nairobi and the Global Center on Adaptation, so that we will benefit from your expertise as students and faculty body, but that also that we, where possible, can also work with you to strengthen your um, insights into the field of adaptation indeed. So thank you again so much, and um, this was a very um, honorable uh, occasion to be here in Nairobi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, um...
It's good to have you back in Nairobi for just a moment. Um, and I, I know you were last here 10 years ago. Um, let's have you here a little more often than just every 10 years, shall we? Uh, thank you very much. Remember, members of the press, you'll have an opportunity for some more questions in just a little while. Now, we've come to the close of the annual lecture session, um, but we still got uh, the partnership forum that's coming up in just a moment. And so, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to call up on stage to give a closing statement to this annual lecture, Kenya's Cabinet Secretary for the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, Mr. Keriako Tobiko. Karibu sana. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, uh, speaking of uh, my boss, the president has spoken, and after uh, all the global leaders have spoken. And after Patrick, very compelling speech, presentation, the VC uh, is not easy. I don't want to make a speech because I have none. But I think we need to be real. Climate change is not theory. That is not to say you, the academics, have no role to play. Of course you do, in terms of your research, scientific research and data and knowledge. The climate crisis is a matter of life and death. How many more people have to die? How many more children in Kenya, in Africa, in climate vulnerable countries have to go without food, have to walk kilometers? How many more girls have to be prematurely removed from school to be married off or to fall off school because they have to spend with their mothers entire days searching for water and firewood. How many more? How many more have to, lose their, uh, have to lose their livelihoods and their property. In Kenya, and our president say this, we live in a perpetual state of crisis, emergencies, related and attributable to climate impact. When it rains, what happens? It's a crisis. Flash floods. Mudslides. Rising lake levels that cause devastation to communities and biodiversity. Infra infrastructure is washed off. How many more in Kenya, in Africa, would have to die and to suffer as we continue to make speeches? Conference after conference. Well, we are going to COP26. We are banging our hopes on COP26, but it is COP26. I suppose there has been, there must have been COP1. Is it not? You count it, you count it up to, and now we are talking about next year, which will be the African COP, COP26. How many more COPs? How many more promises and pledges? You know, <laughs> the, under the convention, 
the UN framework on climate change convention, we call it the UNFCCC. Africa was recognized in the convention, specifically for the reasons that we are now being told. For good reason. Africa, firstly, and our president and those who have spoken. For Africa, because of its location, 1.5 degrees centigrade does means actually two plus almost three degrees centigrade. So when we hear all this debate about whether it is 1.5 or two, for us, we wonder, what is the discussion about? We in Africa are already living beyond two degrees centigrade. The consequences are there too obvious to see. And it attracts a lot of sympathy from our benefactors, so-called friends and partners, development partners. In terms of relief and humanitarian aid. That's not what we deserve. We don't need your philanthropy or charity. I was telling the Fizi and Patrick uh, yeah, that in my community, uh, the used to think, a community think, used to think that, to believe that all these uh, climate hazards, or climate related hazards, are God's punishment to us, natural disasters. God's punishment, and they keep on asking, so where have we gone wrong, our Almighty, our Creator? They used to think that it is God's punishment. And they used to atone for that, the sins they believe they committed against their gods. Used to slaughter, sacrifice, Little did they know that it had nothing to do with the sins they have committed. It is nothing to do with natural hazards. It is as a consequence of human action. I'm sure you, the scientists, you have read, and there has been reference in this uh, discussion to the IPCC uh, assessment report six. Which says, and these are scientists, which says it is unequivocal, and, and it's so rare for scientists to use such terminology. It is unequivocal that climate change is caused by human action. Not the gods, it is we, the human beings. But who are these? It is also scientifically correct, so, so that I can, that 20 countries, 20 countries globally, the most developed, and some developing but have joined in, 20 countries. that control 80% of the global GDP, 20 countries that control 80% of the global GDP. They have the means, they have the technology, they have the capacity, and these 20 countries contribute 80% of total global, what, emission. So let's not really try and sort of be diplomatic here. There's nothing about diplomacy here. It's a matter of life and death. 80%. And these are the countries, the same countries that in 2009, 
I, of course, I understand why Patrick is a little bit excited about the delivery plan. I, I, am, a, I am a bit shocked myself about this so-called delivery plan. For oh, This 100 billion commitment is actually over 10 years old. 10 years old. It was given by the countries that bear the greatest responsibility in terms of emission levels. 2009. 2009. And the commitment, which is actually a contractual treaty obligation, it's not philanthropy, not charity. The commitment was that they will be contributing yearly, every year, 100 billion, not 100 billion one off. Because I think, no, 100 billion per year by 2020. You just do the mathematics. Now, come 2020, we are told, well, you know, we have a few challenges here and there. Uh, we think we have relying on some report of 2017, 2018 by OECD. That we have managed to mobilize 80 billion. And we're going to give you a delivery plan. And this is now where we're going to give you a delivery plan on how to raise that 100 billion between 2020 and 2024. Goalposts have shifted. Goalposts have. In the meantime, what is happening? So I'm not myself particularly excited. So in fact, what, what happens here is there is trust has been broken. If you did not, and you have the means, and you are actually responsible for what we are going through, if you did not deliver on your pledge, your obligation 10 years old, so should we clap and celebrate now that you have come back to us and say, oh, wait a moment, now this time I am serious about it. We can't take you by your word, or should we? So serious questions have to be asked here. And I like the questions that have been, <laughs> these two journalists who are asked questions. To the point, to the point, this is a point. One, and the Paris Agreement and the Convention are clear. It talks about adequate financing, adequate financing. How do you measure adequacy? Adequacy must be measured against the established needs. You don't throw a coin into the air, and then you say you did. What is the basis of the 500 billion now? Adequacy must be determined based on needs assessment. The needs assessment for Kenya are there. They are known. We have written about it. We have the soul too for Africa and the developing countries. So one, adequacy. Is the 100 billion adequate? Is the 500 billion now that is being offered in the delivery plan adequate? What is the basis for that? The second point, and I think it was actually again alluded to by the, in the question, sorry if I take too long, but is additionality, additionality. And please mark, because these are critical additionality. In other words, that financing flow must be on top, not in lieu of. Now, what has been happening, and our friends here, uh, what they do is, they commingle, they put together, even that 80 billion, actually you ask them, of that 80 billion, so adequacy, uh, additionality on top of. Now they have commingled it with what we call overseas development assistance. Right? 
overseas development assistance. It's, it's not additional. It's not additional. And then we have conditionality. And again, the question raised here. Conditionality. A lot of that money, the little money that has been, uh, resources that have been provided, it's actually in terms, not in terms of grants, concessions. A lot of it is in terms of debt. And then finally, accessibility. And you hit the nail on the head. Accessibility. It takes a minimum of three years. I've been there. I know. And now we're being told here, lectured about bankable proposal based on data and science. It's almost an excuse. It takes a minimum of three years for any project, under, whether it's under GCF, whether it's under Jeff and my colleagues are there, or adaptation. Sometimes you try and try until you give up. Uh, so we are then told first, so one, in order to restore trust, and this is what we actually in the pre-cops and also the ministry, we've been telling our, our colleagues, please, in order to, cre uh, to restore trust, can you ensure that 100 billion pledge is delivered before COP26? before put the money on the table as we go to COP26, then we will know or believe that you are serious and you can be taken by your word. Now we are told 2023. In the meantime, what happens? And then we are told, so, uh, so anyway, so I don't, I, let, let me not, uh, so, uh, Okay, fine. So, even the little money that comes after a lot of struggle, where does it go? Where does it go? Does it reach the ground? Does it reach the ground? Or it comes and it's there and there and there and there and then yet the rubber meets the tamak, the road, there. You know, for us, we have, we can, we have our own adaptive capacities because we can do aircon technology, we have the resources. How about your mothers and our fathers and our sisters? They don't have the luxury. How much of that money goes to the ground? Does it translate into Better livelihood. So, point I'm making here, and now, you know, when I came in, I was still excited. I'm to travel in the next, uh, I think, the day after tomorrow to COP. I was hopeful. Uh, but this delivery plan that I have just heard about now gives me reason to very much doubt. Now, then, finally, and this is where the GCA uh, comes in and the, the African, African acceleration uh, adaptation. They are telling us, oh, oh, you know, we have not yet operationalized Article 7. We have not yet agreed on the goals, adaptation goals. Why haven't you? And what we tell them is, please go to Africa. Go look for African Development Bank. Go to the, the Global Adaptation Center. Because they themselves, even without Articles Article 7, have already demonstrated in the form of a AAAP. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, uh, African Development Bank. You have, Africa has the solutions. You don't need any more interpretation of Article 7. You have a classic model in the form of a, a, a triple AP, and now you don't need more science. If you ever needed science, you have it in the report that today has been launched. I thank you very much, and uh, 
I, I would have said much, but I don't want to spoil uh, your evening. Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency Kiriako Tobiko, Cabinet Secretary for Kenya's Ministry of Environment and Forestry. It's, um, we're getting into a changeover in just a moment because we're going into the GCA Africa Partnership Forum of 2021. But first, you know, it's important for us to understand that this, like we said, cannot be done alone. And I think Professor Vakoyan also spoke to many of you here who are scholars and academicians in this field. And youth leadership is obviously very, very important. And so that is why we're honored to be here at the University of Nairobi. As we're told by the Vice Chancellors, over 60,000 students, um, you know, across the different faculties. So some great things there and also a lot happening here with respect to climate change. And so that's why it's important for us to now hear from the youth, um, I won't say leaders of tomorrow, that cliche is overused, you are the leaders right now. So ladies and gentlemen, let's put your hands together for two um, students here at the Un University of Nairobi Faculty of Law. Um, and they are the winners, by the way, of the Kenya National Drama Festival of 2019 for Best Play Production. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for a narration on climate change. Virginia Waringa and Silas Owiti from the Theatre of the Absurd. In the beginning. In the beginning. When the earth was void and formless god said let there be light and immediately light filled the whole of taifa hall greater and brighter than the courts of mahatma Gandhi. then god took dust from the soil and molded it into a man and breathed into it the, the breath, breath of life then god took this man and, and said put to him, him to the garden of eden and said to him please be fruitful and uh, multiply. Then God told the land to produce vegetation, seed bearing plants, and trees to bear fruit and seed in it. And as the land was producing trees of life, man, man cut, cut it all. So, ladies and gentlemen, life is sweet when we eat from the tree of knowledge. Life is even sweeter when that same knowledge helps us to create the roads, machines, electricity, and fuel intensity. But this knowledge will not help us when we use it to get a degree that will not favor the global temperature. Or a master's that will not engineer the ecological thermometer. And a professor that cannot prophesy the invasions of locusts in the country. So Mr. and Mrs. Doctors and professors. Ladies and lasses. We can mark all the seasons black and white from the sun to the moon all with the help of mr banky moon we can sing all the blues but if we do not have a sustainable blue economy armed to the tooth then it is not worth our bluetooth so in kenya with a plus and a tick in the ban of single-use plastic in Kenya. So we decided not to join in the popular mantra, Hakuna Matara. <laughs> and instead, uh, write this official letter to the global village. <clears throat> Dear, Dear society, society, it is with utmost concern that we write this letter. I hope you are well. I know that you are not well, <laughs> but I just had to ask to make this letter look official. <laughs> See, it was just the other day that we were invaded with locusts. It was not just any other biblical locust play. It was the critical climate change crisis. These locusts came to destroy trees and vegetation. But they were disappointed because there were not enough plantations for them to feed on. <laughs> and just like these locusts, we are using more than what we are planting. Did you know that papers come from trees? But yet we are using more papers to write on tree conservation. Rather than making more trees to make more of this paper. Is this a vision? A mission? Or a fiction? Because all we can say is that we don't have any affection. Or any direction. All we have is assumptions. Assumptions. Assumptions without any clear dimension. If an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Then planting a tree a day will keep global warming away. For its papers, I can write only a poem. And with a tree, I can write poetry. A dear ah. society. For you. 
A tree is an industry. A chemistry. A ministry for pleasantry. And no sooner had we made the factory than the carbon entry overflowed the country. Emissions, emissions, emissions. But we have a solution. When you are buying shares and stocks in industrial companies, we will also give you those industrial waste coming out of those companies and stock them for you as part of your capital. Mm -hmm. Yes. But we know GCA has more plans for you. So we will partner together for policies. In our country, we call it a handshake. <laughs> and we will uplift each other and not just the cafe. As we climb the African mountain together with our Vice Chancellor Professor Stephen Kiama with his key and Ama, we welcome you all <laughs> to adopt other climate change initiatives. Not only in Africa, but all beyond. You are sincerely. Theater of, of the, the absurd. absurd, the University of Nairobi, Silas Brian Owiti, and Virginia Waringa. From the fuck. Culty of Law, Drama Society, Awola. Unbelievable. What a great presentation. Um, can we give them another round of applause? That was amazing. That was absolutely amazing, Professor Kiama. If this is it, then, you know, we're looking forward to certainly, definitely much more. Thank you very much. The theater of the absurd and um, yes, there is definitely uh, much to look for. I mean, how do I come after something like that? Let me just reiterate that the GCA has a youth leadership program and its aim is to make sure that young people are at the center of driving the adaptation agenda as well as its implementation across the world. So thank you. And thank you once again to the University of Nairobi for your hospitality, for having us here. So we're going to move over into our next um, part of the program, which is the GS GCA Africa Partnership Forum of 2021. The theme of that is delivering adaptation together. We'll need a brief changeover, but I don't want you to leave the room. Please do stay here with us. Those of you who are online, please do stay logged on as well. Um, and at this point, uh, the journalists will have a moment uh, with uh, Professor Vakoyan to ask their questions. It'll be outside on the terrace that's to your left um, of this hall. So that will be happening right now as we speak. But give us a moment for a brief changeover. We come back and get into the partnership forum in just a few minutes. I promise you it'll be less than 10. So please don't leave the room. Um, we need your attention. It's an equally important part of our day's activities here. So please, uh, ladies and gentlemen, do stay with us, excellencies, and all of you joining us here and online. We shall be back in just a few minutes for that. So stay with us and thank you, everybody. We'll be right back. Today, climate change is wreaking havoc on economies, lives and livelihoods all across Africa. Les effets néfastes des changements climatiques impactent énormément notre zone géographique. Nous en sommes nous ne sommes pas des pollueurs, mais nous sommes impactés énormément. It makes economic sense to build greater resilience against climate change now. Now we turn to the partners. What can we do together? Adaptation has been and it remains a key priority for Africa in our effort to respond to the impact of climate change. Juguler les effets des changements et variabilités climatiques nécessite une large coopération en plus des efforts nationaux. Adaptation needs to be premised as a business and investment opportunity not only a social issue. We must therefore explore all options and solutions for financing climate change adaptation. Adaptation will have to be embedded into policies and institutional frameworks. The agricultural sector is by far the most impacted by climate change in our continent. What's important is the communities, the vulnerable communities, the women across Africa, that get some support and protection because of what we do. And we expect that the work of the GC in Africa will complement our activity in the areas of investing in people, in strengthening coping mechanisms, in building climate appropriate infrastructure, as well as addressing financing gaps.
we launched the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program in support of African nations in this journey. Uh, with the demonstrated leadership of the GCA and the uh, African Development Bank, we have the AAA P, uh, P program. This has been an inspiration for action. I'm humbled, we are humbled by the African leaders and heads of states and government for their commitment for action. We know what it takes, we've listened very carefully. We stand ready to support you in that journey.
All right, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen who are joining us here and online, we are ready to begin, um, I dare say, one another important part of our day here today. Welcome to the GCA Africa Partnership Forum. The theme of this is Delivering Adaptation Together. And we're going to be hearing from uh, some keynote speakers here today who will be giving us their thoughts on how we can deliver adaptation together and then we will get a chance to interact and have a great conversation here this afternoon and so ladies and gentlemen and excellencies allow me to introduce to you our first speaker all the way from the democratic republic of congo she is the deputy prime minister at the ministry of environment and sustainable development her excellency eve bazaiba your excellency bienvenue Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to welcome very warmly everyone who is attending uh, this uh, conference, students, first of all, but I would also want uh, to uh, congratulate our president Uhuru Kenyatta uh, for his uh, speech and his leadership. I know this is also a very important day for him as this is his birthday. So dear president, happy birthday. And uh, thank you so much for um, inviting the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, to uh, this meeting on adaptation. And I would also would like to uh, thank the Secretary General of the UN, Ban Ki-moon, and the uh, Professor uh, Patrick, and all of the leaders that we've been able to listen to um, since the beginning of today. So to talk about adaptation, I would like for us to be able to understand what adaptation, adaptation is, because adaptation, I mean, this is a word that just comes out of nowhere, but what is adaptation? I'm talking here about all of the communities that are able to adapt to the new world we're living in, the world in which we have global warming. And so Africa needs to change its behavior, the idea is for them to disrupt the way African people live so that we can protect humanity against global warming. We've heard the former Secretary General of the United Nations and Secretary General for the Environment uh, Ministry. And we know that 20, 20 countries um, are responsible for 80% of CO2 emissions. And so now we have this big part of Africa that's supposed to be saving humans. What well, would be true? Africa is the answer to global warming. When I'm saying that Africa is the solution and Africa is the answer, I'm talking here about Congo. I'm talking about the region of Congo where my country is. We have the necessary resources to enable the world to reach the objectives that we have, the mitigation goals that we have and to maintain the world temperature at 1.5, thanks to its forests. We have millions of hectares of humid forests, of tropical forests. And this forest can absorb all of the CO2 emissions next to these. Uh, forest. We also have mangroves. And we also have what we called what we call peatlands that are able to absorb most of the CO2 emissions that we are generating. So what should we do as Africans? We need to modify our behaviors. The forest is where we can find our food. This is where we can get all of our resources for the rest of our lives. And this is where we're supposed to be cultivating as well. We're supposed to have crops that we can, um, so that we can feed our citizens and the rest of the world. For schools, for example, for the boards that we have in classrooms, we need wood. 
we need wood for a lot of things. I mean, we need wood to create uh, chairs and beds and to warm our households as well. And we need to change our behaviors, our habits, so that we can cultivate in our country, in our forest. We need to be able to cut trees down. We're supposed to be able to have some nice crops, for example. We need to stop doing that and we need to adapt to the new situation we are in. So we need to adapt to what we have today. We need to have, we need to stop burning the forest. We need a mechanical agriculture as well. We need to have improved uh, semis. We need well-prepared land so that we can have good crops. And for all of this, we need the means, we need the money as well to preserve that forest. We need to have the means so that we do not have to use wood to warm our households. Because I mean, we also use wood to warm our households. But we also use that wood for SMEs. So we always need that wood so that we can manufacture, I don't know, soap or anything else, any type of um, SMEs that need this type of power. We always need to have this wood for bread. We need wood as well for to create bricks and uh, build our homes. And so if we do not want to put too much pressure on this forest, we need to adapt and we need to preserve our forest. And for that, we need to have alternative, alternatives and alternate solutions. I'm talking about electrical power, I'm talking about solar panels, I'm talking about wind power and all other type of energy, such as biogas. And for this, we need the money, we need the means, we need to adapt to the uh, situation we are in, to the crisis we're going through. And our forest is basically the lung, one of the lungs of the uh, planet. So we need to preserve that so we can absorb the pollution that is emitted to reach those objectives, Africa will have to give answers. Africa is the solution. The Congo region is part of the solution. And this is the solution that, we'll, that we have so that we can face that global warming. We are tired of having all of these promises and all of these pledges. It's been 10 years already, more than 10 years. It's more than a decade that we've been waiting on those countries to abide by their engagement. So now, we are asking new conditions to have access to this financing. There is this very complicated process and it's extremely complicated for us to access this finance, this uh, funding. We need the COP26 in Glasgow. So I'm talking about the speeches and the different engagements. We need this to translate into action. And this needs to be translated into actions before the COP27 because the Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo has big ambitions. They want to organize COP27. Because when we're talking about peatlands and we're talking about forests, we're talking about those natural resources. And we shouldn't be talking about that only you know, digitally. We need to see that in the ground. And for you to be able to see that, we invite you to come directly. Uh, in the RDC so you can see with your own eyes. I'm hoping that people are still listening to me and that I haven't uh, lost my connection so far. Thank you, thank you so much. Your thoughts, I'd like us to move to our next speaker and that is Mr. Ibrahima Diong. Uh, we're delighted to hear from you, sir, as Assistant Secretary General and Director General of the African Risk Capacity Group. Uh, please share your thoughts with us, sir. Well, thank you very, very much for that warm introduction. I'm not sure I can top the call for action by the minister. She spoke with passion, but also with commitment. So I am hope uh, we can take it from there and basically provide you a perspective. A, a very good afternoon from the beautiful city of Johannesburg and all protocol observe. I am delighted to be here. 
to share our perspective from the African Union, but also from the organization managed by the United Nations called the African Risk Capacity. Let me begin by expressing our, our gratitude to GCA for not only this invitation, but also by putting adaptation on the map as we march or run to a COP26 to make sure that the interest of Africa is on the table when commitment are made at COP26. Let me also say how much I'm comforted by the statement we heard this morning from the different leaders from around the world and underscoring the importance of adaptation for Africa with the hope that the momentum will be kept all the way to COP26. Let me make a couple of points to add to the conversation, but also to what the minister has said so far, by saying as far as Africa is concerned, the impact of climate change is real. It's the impact of drought, flood, tropical cyclone, and other disasters that we are used to seeing in Africa. But what I wanted to highlight is the human face of that uh, impact. And that is the impact it has on the vulnerable communities in terms of food securities, and uh, some of the markets saying their assets to survive as well. Now for us to actually make Africa more resilient, we need two things, leadership and strategic partnership. On the leadership side, the African Union has decided to lead by creating an institution entirely dedicated to supporting Africans who want to transfer their risk to the insurance market so they can mobilize additional resources to take care of the vulnerable communities. On the strategy of partnership, I'm delighted we signed a partnership with GCA, underscoring the importance of joining forces together to make Africa more resilient going forward. And I also like to recognize the leadership of the African Development Bank, which not only provide resources, but capabilities to make Africa more resilient. The organization that I run demonstrate that was a combination of different partnership, you can indeed contribute to African resilience. In our particular case, since our inception, we've been able to actually provide up to $720 million worth of coverage. But more importantly, we're able actually to protect 72 million Africans who are faced with the challenges of climate change. Let me finish up by highlighting two points that are extremely important in the triple A P of the GCA, in which I believe it's going to be a game changer going forward who's got adaptation in Africa. Number one, the pillar of innovative financing to make sure that we can provide Africa the funding that it requires. And I hope at COP26, the commitment has been made by the developing world, developed world, I should say, will be kept so we can provide the resources as well. On that note, I'd like to underscore the importance of putting together a premium financing instrument which will help African countries to be more resilient. I think second pillar that in the triple AP, it's about the smart digital advisory uh, whereby we can provide risk modeling tools to Africans so they can understand the risk profile and make a decision as well. Let me finish up by quoting the chair of the African Union and that is to say Africa is tired of waiting because climate change has an impact on our GDP by making a loss of 15%. And if you continue to where we are, about 100 million Africans will be kept in poverty, and that is not acceptable. So we could not wait to make sure through AAAP and through the work that we do, we can actually make Africans stop waiting so the commitment are kept, so we can make Africa more resilient while we adapt to the impact of climate change. So on that note, thank you very much, and over to you, Madam Moderator.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Diong, for your remarks here. And uh, like you said, we will be getting into that triple AP, that's the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program conversation, which uh, will be happening in just a moment here. As you can see on stage, we've got the Regional Director for Africa, Professor Anthony Nyong, and uh, that's from the GCA. And we've also got uh, Kenya's Cabinet Minister or Cabinet Secretary in the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, and they will be going a little deeper into the triple AP and having a conversation around that. But first, uh, ladies and gentlemen, may we please have your attention for Dr. Kevin Kariuki, who is the Vice President, Power, Energy, Climate and Green Growth at the Africa Development Bank Group. Dr. Kariuki, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Um, uh, Professor uh, uh, Patrick Van Cohen, CEO of the Global Center on Adaptation. Waziri and friend uh, Keriako Tobiko, Cabinet Secretary for Ministry of Environment and Forest in Kenya. Uh, Honorable Lee White, uh, Minister of Water, Forest and Sea uh, and Environment, the Minister in Gabon. Honorable uh, Eve uh, Bazaiba, Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Andugu Ibrahima Chek Diong, UN Assistant Secretary General and Director General of the Africa Risk Capacity Group. Distinguished participants, I am glad to participate in this second GCA partnership forum. It, seems, it still seems like yesterday when the GCA approached the African Development Bank and requested us to host its Africa Regional Office and to establish a strategic partnership to deliver adaptation dividends to the African continent. Yes. This was in August 2020, last year. We gladly accepted both requests, having considered the partnership inevitable on account of our shared vision on adaptation. With the Africa Development Bank having been the first MDB to achieve parity between adaptation and mitigation financing in 2019, we therefore saw the, the partnership with GCA as a recognition of this accomplishment and an encouragement to do more on adaptation in Africa. A lot has happened since then. Last year, we had further raised our adaptation finance to 63%, with just 37% going to mitigation. Indeed, I believe the bank is still the only MDB to have surpassed parity, the parity threshold, as, as was duly recognized by the UN Secretary General at the recent UN General Assembly, who called on others to emulate the bank. We have continued to prioritize adaptation for obvious reasons. First, the entire African cont continent, comprising of 54 nations, contributes less than 5% of global emissions. Second, the African continent bears the brunt of the adverse impacts of climate change, as validated by the recently released Sixth report of the, on, of the International uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. Third, Africa, despite bearing the brunt of impacts of climate change towards, towards which it has contributed the least, only receives just a paltry 3% of global uh, climate finance. In 2020, just to give uh, perspective, this amounted to a mere $18 billion. These resources are simply inadequate, considering that IMF estimates that Africa will need up to 40 billion per year by 2030, which is only a few years away. Hence, the African Development Bank and the Global Center on Adaptation teaming up to develop the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program. The operative word here is acceleration, as time is of the essence. This Africa owned an Africa-led initiative seeks to mobilize $25 billion to support adaptation through four, four bold uh, ideas and will upscale and accelerate adaptation in Africa. In this regard, I am pleased to reiterate that the Africa Development Bank has committed to deliver the first half of this amount, that is $12.5 billion. The AAAP is designed to mobilize the remaining 12.5 billion for several in innovative sources. 
We are hopeful that our international development partners will support the upstream and downstream facilities that are being established at the GCA and the African Development Bank, respectively, to implement uh, the AAAP. AAAP, that is the uh, Africa Acceleration and Adaptation Program, was developed, building on the vision and work plan of the Africa Adaptation Initiative. It sets itself to be able to implement the priority areas and the adaptation targets of the national determined contribution of African countries. I am pleased to note that the targets set by uh, AAAP are underpinned by science, as we have seen in the state and trends report that was launched earlier this afternoon. I am happy to see that the report, contrary to general held opinion, that adaptation is a public good and has no value, makes uh, a business case for adaptation. The report clearly shows investments in adaptations have positive cost-benefit ratios. Indeed, it is smart economics to invest in adaptation. We are already partnering with GCA on some of our projects in agriculture, resilient infrastructure, youth employment and entrepreneurship, and innovative financing initiatives. I am happy to announce here that a Kenyan farm, the, climate, the Kenya Climate Innovation Center, has won our bid to manage our first youth challenge under Triple AP. Ten winners, five men and five women, will be given up to $100,000 and business incubation and acceleration support to move their businesses to, to profitability. We are also partnering in the developing uh, innovative financing instrument to mobilize the resources needed to implement uh, the Triple AP. We will continue to support the priorities of the African continent. Africa serves as a major carbon sink through our oceans and forests. We must therefore not spare any efforts to preserve this as they are key to residents, uh, to residents' efforts on the continent. I therefore look forward to lively discussion on how we can accelerate adaptation in Africa through AAAP, bringing together both the public and private sectors. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Kariuki. Let's give him a round of applause um, there. And um, I would like us to now have um, this conversation uh, for a moment. And um, thank you, gentlemen, uh, for joining me here. Um, and I'll start with you, Professor Nyong, from um, you know, the GCA. Perhaps you could continue to elaborate on the triple AP and um, you know, what more opportunities uh, you, you see. Yeah, thank you so very much for the question. Um, and thanks, colleagues, for being around. The AAAP is an innovation. The Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program is an innovation. Why, why am I saying that? We've had several adaptation initiatives on the continent, pilots here, pilots there. I think if you were an aircraft, would have the largest number of pilots anywhere you can imagine, because everything was so, you know, uh, disjointed, fragmented, and so on. And then we had the COVID. It came, it stayed with us. COVID did not sign a truce with climate change. While I'm here, you hold on. You know, we need to realize that these two things have come upon us, not will come upon us. Every initiative we take now should be able to address the issues of COVID and also build resilience, not just to climate change, but other disasters that could and will actually happen. You know, and that's why the GCA is quite um, unique in that aspect, that it completely looks at the issues of COVID, knows it's here with us, and then how do we build, use the opportunity of COVID to do the things differently from the way we did them before that put us in this same situation that we've found ourselves in. Yes, and I, I'm pretty sure you, um, you know, want to... Uh, you know, drive the conversation and drive the agenda when it comes to the implementation of the same. Um, you know, and, and, and this is your moment now. I mean, um, I know we want to involve quite a bit of, of, of uh, the audience members, both here and online. Um, so, Professor, this, this really is uh, your baby at the GCA. Yeah, actually, you know, it's um, when we were developing the, GC, the AAAP, we did it after a partnership forum like this. The GCA had what they call the Africa Work Program that basically looked at work streams, 
You know, my problem with work streams usually is they're endless. You don't really have clear, def clearly defined projects. So we started consultations with uh, shareholders, stakeholders. What is it that we need to address? We looked at the Africa Adaptation Initiative that African heads of sets are taking to COP21. We looked at the nationally determined contributions of African sets, the national adaptation plans. We looked at the regional strategy of the African Union Commission. What are those four things that we can do that will be transformational? Everyone has whatever they want to do, but we did a very thorough review of this and found four missing gaps that still needed reinforcement. And the first is agriculture. Everybody else is doing things on agriculture, no problem. But we realize we can't do agriculture the way my grandmother did it. Things have changed. We need to modernize agriculture a bit. Climate change has come to stay. We need to factor that into our planting. If farmers knew that the rains would not come in September, October, as we're going, and then they knew what else to do to make an income in that period, knowing with full certainty that the rains will come in December. I think they can plan better. Now we don't have that knowledge. So digital technologies would help us. We're in the days of the fourth industrial revolution, getting to the fifth. How do we modernize our agriculture? How do we take advantage of the digital solutions that are available? Where that has been done, we've seen um, productivity increased by between 40 and 70 percent. We've seen incomes go up higher, and we want to do that on the African continent. The second thing we looked at was infrastructure. You know, that 70 percent of Africa's infrastructure is yet to be built. This should be a blessing in disguise that we can do things differently. Africa cannot afford to build a road that five years down the line you point to that road and say there used to be a road there because the tornado or the hurricane has washed it away. This is the time for us to make sure that whatever we're doing, we build resilience into it. We've seen the advantages of using nature-based solutions. When you do sea walls, concreting, it disrupts the dynamics of nature. We've seen where people have inculcated things like mangrove planting that will still achieve the same goals of the seawall at a much cheaper price. We've seen how planting trees and other things have cleaned water systems, groundwater, and so on. So we are doing that. That's the second bit for our infrastructure. And then we've also realized that many people do not understand how the public and the private sector could come together under public-private partnerships for resilient infrastructure because they still think adaptation is a public good. So we've developed a whole program on public, uh, private public partnerships. Then thirdly, I'll quickly go through this, the youth. Africa is a very young population, median age 19.7. These are all very young people. And if we don't do something about it, it can become a liability on us. But we know that these are assets. The youth are an asset. Why would there be a problem if, one, we cannot create jobs for them? So we've developed a framework that we apply to screen projects to ensure that each project you put money out there will create decent green jobs for the youth. And then for those who are not really to be employed, they are those who are entrepreneurs themselves. We have set up a very strong entrepreneurial development program, like uh, the uh, vice president of the bank noted. The first is to select 10 winners, five men, five women, from our competition that will be announced at COP26. Each of them would get up to about $100,000 each to scale up their small businesses under very serious tutelage, uh, under incubation, under handholding, under acceleration. So we're going to bring people who've been there, who've done it, to guide those suits through uh, that. Then the final thing we're looking at is on finance. Frankly speaking, I see the disappointment of the cabinet secretary. We all are very disappointed. Unfortunately, there's no court 
that we can take those who made promises and did not keep promises. There's no way we take them to court for now. He's a lawyer. I would really love to see us do that, you know, that we take them to court and say, you promised this, you need to deliver it. But right now, there isn't. So what we're doing is, when it push comes to shove, when the locusts invaded Kenya, it was a Kenyan problem. We were all left behind. You sort yourselves out. So we need to really look at ways in which we can mobilize resources from the donors, or I don't like calling them donors, international development partners, from our own local businessmen. How do we encourage our businessmen? How do we encourage investors into the country and into African countries so that we can raise resources? We're exploring other innovative finances like debt for climate swap. How can we convert some of the debt countries are owing to climate activities and let those countries say, I couldn't give you money, but part of your debt, I've written it off so that you can use it okay. to do some climate change issues. Yeah, and that's important. Professor Nyong, you, you have this opportunity now and you've um, you know, clearly elaborated uh, some very key aspects of the triple AP. Uh, you're sitting here with uh, you know, um, a, a representation of African leadership. Uh, what are some of the questions that you, know, you might want to pose or what would you like to see? What sort of concerns? Um, this is the moment now uh, for a conversation here. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad he's, he's here. Um, going to COP, Africa's leadership is directly behind this. One, because the COP presidency is talking about adaptation and resilience, which really resonates with us. But Africa should not and will not go to COP begging. We have putting options on the table. When you look at this report, that we've published, it gives you all the different opportunities that are there for investment, for support. I'm not saying that those who made promises should go free from making, from delivering. They must be held accountable. But we should be able to come together and say, we hold you accountable. While you do that, we ourselves, we are moving on with our development. And that's the message I'm hoping that uh, when we get to COP, it would be, this is not a begging game. You owe us. Uh, Kevin Kairiki talked about the seas and the forest. Africa's forests hold the bulk of the emissions, particularly the Congo Basin. There's a pit line in the Congo Basin that, if disturbed, will emit greenhouse gas much more than all the cars in the U.S. for 30 years. And our leaders, our countries are doing everything to preserve that pit land. And they're not compensated for it. Nobody's paying attention to them. And I'm saying this should be the bargaining tools that we are providing global services to the world that the world needs to pay for. We're not begging you for your money. We're asking you to pay for the services that Africa is delivering to the world. Yeah, and indeed, uh, and I know, you know, we want to hear not just from you here, but from uh, those who are joining us online. Um, and um, are we ready with uh, one of them to just uh, have them, um, you know, be here? And of course, if you want to um, contribute as well to this discussion, for those of you who are joining us online, please put your virtual hand up. Uh, and then only unmute yourself when prompted to do so. And at this point, uh, Renee Van Hel, um, do we have you with us? Um, can we have you with us and uh, speak to us and give us your contribution and your thoughts? Mr. Mm -hmm. Cabinet Secretary, yeah, we'll come yeah. to you in a moment. Yeah. Renee? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Am I audible? You need to have five PRs. Loud Hello? and clear, Renee. Yes, all right, all right. Well, I'm very enthused to be able to partake in this important meeting. And what I really take back is that people speak here with passion, ambition, and impatience. And I don't know if Dutch people, people from the Netherlands are known to be passionate, but we have ambition and we are also impatient. And that's the message that I would like to share with our, with our partners. <laughs> yes. uh, I will speak about three things, okay. Okay. climate diplomacy, financing, and the nexus, climate, food, water. Thanks. Um, speaking about climate diplomacy, um, my, my country uh, contributes, really tries to contribute in the diplomatic circles and is very active on mitigation and the adaptation agenda. We, we, we work and we strive for higher ambitions 
and the implementation needs to be accelerated and please beyond words. Adaptation doesn't get the attention it deserves worldwide. While the impact of climate change, as many already have laid, uh, laid out and echoed, and that I can only echo, is already being felt worldwide, and not worldwide, but also just by ordinary people. So one of the reasons for the Netherlands to organize the Climate Adaptation Summit earlier this year in January was to also have a, be able to specially focus on Africa and what's going on there. And why this special focus on Africa? Because Africa is the most vulnerable continent to climate change impacts. And at the same time, climate change provides opportunities for African countries, as the previous speakers, for example, laid out. And to really harness huge resource potential and to create market opportunities, to attract investments and to generate green jobs, green jobs for Africa's young population. Um, it's also about strengthening civil society. We're also focused on strengthening civil society and a closer co collaboration between what we call the national and local governments. And one of the conclusions also of the Climate Adaptation Summit in, two, in January was that involving gender aspects in our policies, and of course the youth is, are also very important for a road to success. Financing, it, it's been said. Um, globally, only one fifth of, cli of climate funding goes to adaptation, and that's too low. And, and also the cake is, is still too small, and more needs to go to adaptation. Uh, the Netherlands spends at least 50% of our public funding, uh, the climate funding, which is mainly grant-based on adaptation. And the majority of that money goes to strengthening resilience in Africa. Um, so therefore, it was also fairly easy for us to endorse the Secretary General of the UN's plea for a 50-50% balance in mitigation and adaptation focus on, in climate finance. Another thing that we did as part of our diploma, diplomatic uh, activities, but diplomacy really also to create results, is that we, with a couple of other friends, established the so-called Champions Groups on Adaptation Finance. Um, it has two goals. Uh, first, to increase the total share of climate finance that is spent on adaptation and resilience. And secondly, also to, to advocate for improved quality and accessibility of the adaptation finance, including to ensure that it, that it reaches more truly the local level. Uh, of course, more money is not, only the, is, is not going to solve the problems. We need bankable projects. It, it's about improving the quality and accessibility of finance. And it's also about involving the private sector um, that has knowledge and skills, um, and, and, and also to highlight the many opportunities in Africa for green employment. Um, it's not only about aid, it's about trade, it's about investment, it's about skills, it's about innovation. Uh, thirdly, I was going to say something about the climate uh, food water nexus. Um, but we are all, I mean, I, I, I may, am I new in my new job for two months? And one of the things that we're really trying to work on is to avoid all these silos between water projects, energy projects, and food security projects. We need to work as on what we all try to advocate, this nexus, but it's pretty hard. And um, what, I, what I really take away from the Food System Summit, the Food System Summit that only took place, what is it, six weeks ago, is that there was really a, a good outcome. One of the good outcomes was is that we all agreed on national pathways towards a sustainable uh, food system. And I, my, our ambition is that these national pathways to truly create uh, sustainable food systems, that they are sort of the complement of our national determined contributions to the Paris process. And because we all know that, know that food systems, absolutely also ours, are still good for a third of the man-made greenhouse gases, greenhouse gases. So it's very valuable that in the context of this UN Food Systems Summit, we agreed on national pathways. It's just, just something that I wanted to flag with you. Um, we always say that uh, we need to improve the quality of implementation by building on lessons learned. And it sounds like an open door, but it's still a huge challenge for us, but for everyone. And so let's really, really ha let's have this dialogue also on what lessons we can learn and not, not let's just not repeat that we're going to do that, but let's also really implement that. Um, another thing that, that, that I think is important for us to realize is that there is still a shortage of evidence of what works in adaptation. It's not just the good practices, but also examples of maladaptation. So we really need to speed up our learning process and our feedback processes. And one of the things that is very helpful is that we have this open and safe and, 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 and friendly communication 
and that we're not flowery and, and diplomatic and vague about what works and what does not work. But let's have this communication among friends to really make sure that we, that we do our implementation in a way that is sound for our citizens. So in order to create maximum impact, we need to have inter interventions that have, have adaptation at their core, building on proven best practices to ensure we're imposing the quality and speed of action on the ground where it's urgently needed. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you very much for allowing me to thank make you. a contribution. Thank you very much, uh, Rene, uh, for your contribution, Rene Van Hel. Um, and it's, it's important to hear from you and from as many um, as possible um, during this uh, forum. Um, Mr. Cabinet Secretary, I haven't forgotten you, I'm coming back to you, but I'd like us to um, go from here all the way to Norway and to now hear from Hans Olaf Ibrek, who's uh, Policy Director in the Section for Energy, Climate and Food Security at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Norway. Uh, Mr. Ibrek, your reflections and thoughts? Thank you very much uh, for having me on. Uh, this has been a really interesting event. I've been uh, trying to follow as best as I can uh, from Abu Dhabi. I'm actually not in uh, in Norway these days, but uh, but first, then uh, let me commend the organizer of this event. And it's been a remarkable demonstration of leadership and commitment. Uh, and I hope that the young people in the audience um, have gotten a lot of food for thought, and uh, that you are now quite uh, at least uh, hoping for some real action that's going to happen at uh, COP26. So we are at the crossroad, as uh, many have said, that when you come to a fork in the, in the road, you need to take it. So we are now in the, uh, at the fork in the road and we have to step up climate action on all three targets of Paris, be it mitigation, adaptation and finance. Um, Paris promised, but Glasgow must deliver. So at Glasgow, we need to accelerate delivery on adaptation. And the cabinet uh, secretary clearly spelled, spelled out what he and his colleagues are expecting at COP26. And of course, he's given us a lot of food for thought uh, moving now towards uh, Glasgow. So let me provide a few comments uh, from my side, or overall some uh, reflections, observations. Um, of course, uh, we need to beef up our support to adaptation. We need a better balance. I think that the focus should not only be on quality or quantity, but it also needs to be on, on quality, because and we also have to run these two races at the same time, and both of them will require finance. First, of course, we need to reduce emissions. Uh, the more we mitigate, uh, the less we need to adapt. And the second, we need to start really the race to adapt to a changing climate, because we are already locked in and we can expect far greater climate shocks. Um, and Africa is already there, again, referring to the cabinet uh, secretary. And this is a challenge that we all face together. Of course, Africa will be hit the hardest, and, of course, and in particular, the most vulnerable ones. We also know that adaptation finance does not match the needs, and I don't think, seriously, it will never really match the needs. Uh, uh, then we need to really start tapping into the larger pots of finance. So then uh, we also know, know that African countries receive well below the estimations of adaptation cost. And finance is not reaching the most vulnerable countries, and many of these are also in conflict, and that makes it even harder to reach the most in need. Not all sectors in need receive funding, and that's why I'm, I'm really pleased now with the triple AP program with the strong focus on agriculture and water and other infrastructure area. Agriculture and water receives a fair amount of funding, so of course that's good news, but there are lots of other sectors that also need uh, to receive uh, a lot of more adaptation funding. I noticed in the previous uh, session here there was a lot of discussions about, again, the, the, the quality of uh, our finance and that majority should be given as loans not to not to increase debt levels. A dollar in grant is worth more than a dollar in loan. So I would then like to encourage all donors to increase the share of grants, uh, as was highlighted by the Secretary General and also by Kristalina Georgieva. It is also mentioned that we need to ensure easier access to funds. I'm an, on a board member of the GCF, so again, I noted the Cabinet Secretary's uh, remarks. 
It's not that bad, though, because I think we are now at uh, about 12 months. It doesn't take three years anymore. But I fully uh, sympathize with him that we need to make access more efficient. And I can state that that is also our priority on, on the board. Let me also just add a small caveat on finance. Uh, there's been much talk about the 100 billion, which, of course, are extremely important politically. At the same time, we need to focus on the larger financial flows. And I can just take the, the issue of recovery, uh, COVID-19 recovery spending. We spent about uh, $10 trillion uh, so far, maybe even a, uh, uh, more. And only 17 of this, 17% of this is actually green finance. And I think that was a missed opportunity for us. So in terms of moving forward, a key response from all of us should be to mobilize a much larger share of climate finance today for adaptation and resilience building. And we then need to work together in order to do so. So we need to focus on the keywords of uh, scale, uh, uh, leverage and, and partnership. And I think this is exactly what the IIIP is all about. So when we meet in Glasgow, which is our fork in the road, we need to take the right turn and commit to action. And the case for action has been clearly made uh, at this event. And now it's up to our leaders. And I think that our level of, of combined support to the IIIP will send a clear signal and we need to deliver adaptation action together. So hopefully this can give the young people in the audience some reason for hope. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Eberg, for your thoughts and your reflections on the day we've had and, and the conversations we're having around this. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I know you've been patiently waiting in the wings. Um, so perhaps we can just uh, speak about what happens? We're going to COP26. I know you expressed, uh, you know, your concerns um, quite eloquently a, a little earlier before. So, you know, what's, what's our plan? What's our strategy, um, you know, as we head there next week? Well, I think the first point is um, to, to hear my colleague, a friend say is that civilized countries can enter into treaties and global uh, agreements, but disregard or ignore the obligations because there is no court that they can be taken. I think it is a very, very worrying uh, statement. Because then that raises a fundamental question, then why did we have to end up, for example, in the first case, uh, after serious negotiations running over time, the UNFCCC Paris Agreement, why did we have to then to, why did we complain so seriously in Bimon, uh, the withdrawal then under uh, President Trump for the US from the Paris Agreement? Mm -hmm. Countries enter into, and these treaties are actually table and ratified and legislated in domestic jurisdiction. Uh, I, I think, and uh, so, so that really is a serious point. Uh, and you don't need to be a lawyer yeah. just to see how that. So then how do we keep them accountable? Sorry, sorry, sorry. So how, do, how do we keep them uh, yeah. accountable? Right. There are mechanisms in, in provided, uh, first of all, in fact, if, if I may, uh, some countries already are before the, uh, the International Court of, of, of Justice, mm -hmm. including the small island states. Uh, so it is a matter that has not is being litigated. It is being lit litigated domestically. Actually, uh, countries are being sued by citizens, and and, and this is a matter that is already before the ICJ. So, but but I, I, let's not go into all the jurisprudence. Yeah. I think the point here is mm -hmm. uh, when you enter into treaty agreements, it is it is believed and uh, believed that you will honor those obligations. And secondly. There are mechanisms. In fact, just a, a, a couple of weeks ago, the UN, uh, the UN Human Rights Council, deliberating on that point, uh, um, first of all, agreed unanimously, or oh, with two abstention, uh, that the right, the right to uh, a clean and safe and healthy environment is a fundamental human right. Mm -hmm. So it is also, this implicates, it's not just about uh, diplomacy, it is also a matter now that, right. uh, and, and the UN, uh, the, the, the Human Rights Council has similarly recommended the appointment, the appointment of a special rapporteur, uh, rapporteur for climate change. So there are mechanisms within the established framework of the UN system, including the UN General Assembly, 
and 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 so so, so really that's the point. But the, the second point here is we're not going there to beg. No. Firstly, as Kenya and as African country, we are going to showcase mm -hmm. our leadership, what we have done. And you heard our president. Yeah. What we have done ourselves as countries in combating climate change. Okay. All right? And we're not saying that we, we have to sit idle by yeah. and wait for support. No. We are doing whatever that we must do within our available resources. You just know. And which the president, uh, you know, did say he spoke and, about the commitment. And we're doing far better, commitment. incidentally. Right. We're doing far better than most of these so-called developed countries. Yeah. I'm sorry to say this. Yeah. Uh, we are one of the first countries to develop uh, to deliver uh, the revised NDC mm -hmm. long before. Okay. So, 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 so the yeah. point here, the point I'm making here is, yes. I think let's 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 negotiate in good faith. Okay. Okay. Right? Yeah. And two, it is absolutely important, it is absolutely important that trust be restored. Mm. Trust has been broken. Mm -hmm. And hearing what I had here today, I now extremely skeptical mm. about any more promises that our, our, our our partners will. Uh, okay. Yes. So, so th those are the two, um, you know, the key things: negotiating in good faith, a restoration of trust, um, and of course, going to showcase what we have done and we have made, um, you know, certain commitments and we have examples. I think that have been, uh, you know, so clearly articulated here throughout the day. And so that's where we're credit, going. Giving us those, those what we have is quantifiable. Right. It's Absolutely. Quantifiable. Yeah. Can be monetized. Right. Right. I'm sure, and yeah. they, I, I believe there. Yeah. So any any idea that Kenya and, and Africa and developing countries have just been sitting idle by right. with their begging bowls mm -hmm. uh, is totally misplaced. Absolutely, and and that's that's a good place and at least a good mindset that we now understand we're going into. Um, you know, Professor. You know, as we close, um, you know, we've had some great. Um, you know, articulation here, and, and you know, thank you for your guidance so far. So we've heard how we should be going, uh, you know, to COP26. What are your closing thoughts? Yeah, thanks. One of the reasons we chose to come to Kenya was because Kenya has just demonstrated that leadership, announced boldly that over 10 years they are putting 8 billion. Mm -hmm. no, developing, no developed country has ever made that sort of a promise to any African country and delivered it. The reason I said there's no court, sir, is because we've just heard today the plan, the implementation plan for 100 billion that was promised from last year. Yeah. Not even that it will be done this year. This year, we are expecting to go to COP with 200 billion on the table because it was from last year and this, and year. this year. With the renegotiation of an implementation plan that says we'll reach it in 2025, is shifting the goalposts, kicking the can. And I think it is something that we need to find a mechanism, sir, of making sure that when you make that promise, you will keep your promise because we're part of the global community. And so it's, um, I love the fact that African countries definitely are doing what they're doing. The GCA has offered several African countries, we will, send you professional to work with you in your ministries of finance and environment to articulate, to let tease out those things that we, you are doing. Most times when con African countries go to the Global Green Climate Fund, somebody talked about how difficult it is to access. Mm -hmm. They tell you you don't have money on the table. Forgetting the fact that if you look into your budget, you'll find 500, 600, 800 million dollars of climate-related things, African countries have implemented that. Why can't we tease that out and put on the table and say we've put in $600 million in this agriculture and it's climate-resilient agriculture? You match it. Right. But when we go in, the simple story is, what are you putting on the table? Yeah. So we are available to put people in countries to say, work with these countries, bring out exactly what it is they're doing, let them know that they are doing so much and we can use that as a negotiation tool. 
Indeed, and it is uh, data from this report that we have launched today that will help to have you know, a different conversation, as you say, um, next time when we are going for these conversations. Um, I would really like to thank you, Professor Nyong, for your, for your leadership and guidance um, in this uh, AAA. That's the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program. Thank you. And thank you as well, thank Cabinet you. Secretary uh, Keriako Tobiko. Stay with me here while I close this. Um, don't leave me all by myself. I would like to thank everybody who has joined us, starting with all of you who have been with us online throughout this great auspicious day that we are here, even as we look towards COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland, in the next couple of days. I want to thank my guests here. Thank you very much uh, for so clearly and passionately articulating the issues. Um, and indeed, we know that we're going to negotiate in good faith. There's a restoration of trust that needs uh, to happen, even as we have those conversations. Thank you, Professor Nyong, and our great thanks to uh, Dr. Vakoyan um, as well for his leadership and his very thought-provoking inaugural lecture that we had here that was, you know, full of data, full of statistics, and full of hope and promise that Africa is doing what it needs to do and that if the developed economies want to show how much support they have, then Glasgow is the place to show Africa how much they are committed towards um, the discussion and the implementation of adaptation, which is what we are talking about, moving it forward from mitigation or together with mitigation, but focusing on adaptation and accelerated adaptation at that. And so we have come to the end of this meeting here, and I cannot end it without thanking very much our hosts. A round of applause to the University of Nairobi to the Vice Chancellor, to the students and the faculty. Thank you so much for having us here. Thank you for your hospitality. And thank you very much for the work that you continue to do uh, in climate change for the studies, the programs, the centers that are here. We are truly um, hopeful of what will come out of here. So thank you very much to those here at the University of Nairobi. And thank you to all excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, both here in Nairobi and all around the world. Thank you very much. Let us continue delivering adaptation together and of course it's all about accelerating adaptation in Africa. Thank you all very much and we've come to the end of it. I'm Yvonne Okwara. We will hopefully see you again next time and we'll look forward to the deliberations out of COP26 in Glasgow next week. Thank you everybody. Thank you.